Well, yeah, welcome, perfect. welcome. Uh, we got Matt Crumpton here. Matt Crumpton runs uh, a ton of shit. He is the, he is a fucking boss uh, here in Columbus, Ohio, and doing shit all over the United States. He is an attorney. Uh, he is a musician. He has a band. He runs a camp. He's a super entrepreneur doing literally fucking everything. Got his hands in everything. Um, in the music business, he has a campground. He is a father. He is a, a great friend. Um, he has an awesome podcast called Solving JFK. It is incredible. Uh, follow him on Twitter and uh, check out the podcast everywhere. I'll put links everywhere for this so you can uh, find it easily when this is posted. But welcome, my king. Thank you for joining me today. Um, very glad to have you. And well, let's just kick it off. Like, tell me what's up with your podcast. Where are you at right now? Where, where are you at in the in the process of of releases? How's it doing? How are you? How's life? I, I wanted to show you my new business card. <laughs> this is perfect. It has like four things on it, five things on it. <laughs> this is awesome. I'm a little, I, I do a lot of things. You do a lot of things. So let's just start with, let's start uh, with, let's just start with the front, go Crumpton Legal and yes, work sir. our way through. Yeah, I thought I'd bring an agenda. <laughs> he did. <laughs> His business card is the agenda. He's like, I have five sales pitches for you here. Let's. <laughs> yeah man thanks for having me uh, here to hang out with very you very glad to have uh, you I, i'm into it uh yeah maybe i'll score some ice too so i don't have to yeah, you do keep don't worrying about talking eyes. over the you're so thoughtful cameron thanks you're, you're truly one of the nicest people i love you thanks you're, for saying i that. love you too man and you remind me of a very di- now when i say this it's gonna have a very specific oh. connotation and i don't mean it, it just help it's okay i won't take offense work with me you remind me of of uh a version of Ted Lasso. Oh, great! I love that. I love that. I, I actually watched that thinking. Um, there's that Ted Lasso, and have you seen the Friends episode? I think it's like Eric or Alec Baldwin, where he's like, uh, yeah. the the Miracle Highway or whatever uh-huh. it is, and like make fun of him. Like I feel like I am that guy mm. most of the time. Man, this is really good. Is it? Cheers. Yeah, Woodford Reserve, double oak, double oak, Outstand- outstanding. Um, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Uh, Thanks for that. That's a great. I what I, what I mean compliment. by that is that Ted Lasso is just so like uh, he's genuine. You know what I mean? But you're not used to people being that like openly kind and like thoughtful and genuine. Thank you for that. And so I love you, know, you, too. you know what I mean? To some people, at first you can be like, well, "What's he? What, what's what is this?" But then you're like, "That's he's he really." Is a genuinely Thanks kind for saying that. person. I actually lost some friends thinking that I was fake. I actually <laughs> lost some ki- some kids I known from like from, from high school. Um, one uh, an acquaintance that was he's actually better friends with my brother, but like I would just reach out to him like I do all my friends. I treat I try to treat all my friends like I would any girl that I was in love with, but I'm not trying to fuck. It's like the same energy. So like I text my homies and be like, how are you, my king? What's up with you? Tell me about your life. Yeah. And I do that. I try to do that pretty regularly just to stay in contact. But like some cats would be like, what does this motherfucker want? It, and it's, it's like, dog, I don't want nothing. I'm not going to ask for nothing. Like I'm just asking what's up. <laughs> like That's it. <laughs> Isn't it funny how cynical you know people have become? People, yes. I mean, everybody thinks you want something. And, and I feel that. When people reach out a lot of times, it is because they want something or they're trying to, they have a question and ask. You know, mm-hmm. like it's like, it oh, well, when's the ask coming? It yeah. is. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. Right. Thank you for that. I love you for Cheers, that. Man. Thanks for saying that. Yeah, uh, but I cur- so um, I currently have a law firm, Crumpton Legal. That's He's I had would, forever. He was my attorney back, and when we—that's how we met. Yeah, two thousand eleven. Yeah, yeah two thousand eleven. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, out out of law school, I OU. I went to OU for under Ohio University in Athens, Ohio, for undergrad. Then I went to Capital University Law School uh, and graduated in 07 and kind of hit the grade lottery in law school, uh, and, uh, finished in like the top 2% of my class, Amen. which then got me, it's solely based on where you, what percentage you land as to what job offers you get. It's crazy. Oh, really? Yeah. Like completely. You're like, you're, if you're not in the top 10% where I went to law school, you're not eligible for a big fancy law firm, six figure job. Straight up not eligible. Out of the game. Wow. You have to be on law review, which means you have to be in the top 10%. Wow. Yeah, so your first year grades d- determine how much money you make and your future earning power. Oh my gosh! So one L first year of law school is like uh, it's very very high stress, and it's a forced curve. First too. year, first year. So yeah, so so anyway, I got I got really good grades, 
And I never got like killer crazy grades. I was always like okay coming up. Mm-hmm. But I, I crushed the game in law school because I went to a one. I failed my first exam, and I was like, oh, I'm gonna have to quit law school, and I'm gonna have to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna look stupid. Uh-huh. So I failed my first exam, and uh, and luckily it was only worth five percent of the grade in that class because the teacher was nice and wanted to give us a taste of what a forced curve looks like. Okay. So then I went to this, I started panicking, and I found this class that was like the law school exam writing system, and just all these people, you know, just, it was like a poster in the, mm-hmm. on the law school. And so I went to this class in Cleveland, and uh, basically what the guy said is, he's like, all that matters is you need to, uh, your, your, pre- your professors are going to say that you need to read the books and the discussion matters and coming to class matters. But ultimately, all that matters is what you write down. And since it's a forced curve, everybody that tried, which is everyone because it's their job, they're paying to be here, right? Everybody who tried is going to write approximately the same thing. So your professor has to choose just a very few that are winners, that get to be the A's. They're the winners, okay? And they choose the winners because they write the most like how the professor writes, it's totally subjective nonsense. So how can one find this out? You ask the professor for a sample test, a sample test answer. What would you consider to be a perfect answer, professor? What, what's gotten A's in the past? And then you diagram that answer. You break it down. Oh, sentence one is a thesis statement. Sentence two is this. Sentence, oh, sentence, you know, second paragraph supports this part of the first part. Like you diagram it procedurally. And then... Uh, you, all you study is the law. You ignore everything the professors say, ignore the discussions, don't even go to class uh, unless they like actually, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Un- unless that's accounted for in your grade. Uh-huh. And then you just come in and crush because you literally did what the professor asked and you memorized the format the professor wants in it. Oh my God. So once I switched to that, I started setting the curve in classes. Wow. Yeah. Incredible. <laughs> and like that was just, you went to the class and learned that and it was just you like, okay, I need to learn this. It's an and alternate like- universe, truly. It's it, well, And then I applied it rigorously. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, someone tells you how to lose weight. A straight up scientific method of how to be top of your class in because law it, school. Follow this. I was so scared of getting the, I'd never gotten an F, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So anyway, uh, so so I, I started at this fancy law firm and uh, worked there for two years, and it was cool. I enjoyed it. I liked making good money. I you know was my I was a bachelor. It was mm-hmm. it was great. Uh, but um, ultimately, I got laid off uh, in the the downturn in two thousand eight. So like like March of two thousand nine, and I was pretty bummed about it at the time because I was like. You know, I was like a company man. I was like mm-hmm. very like super. You're in it. Yeah, I was yeah. like a super establishment person also at this time. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so, so anyway, um, I, I got laid off. Then I, I I was offered a job making one third of what I had been making in the public Damn. sector. And uh, I thought, well, I can make one third of what I was making. On my own, I should try before I go like have a boss for one third of what I was making. Mm-hmm. Like I was resigned to the fact that okay, I'm I, I have to climb my way back up now. You know what I mean? But uh, so I, I started my own law firm and um, had a few. Uh, you know the the Hasties really helped me out. Local people here shout around the Hasties. Columbus. Shout out to the Hasties. Uh, as I first got started, and yeah, I started doing music law because I could never represent anybody or help them because they couldn't afford to pay a big law firm. Sure. So, um, so then I could sort of work with more people. I did that, a lot of small business law and, uh, you know, represented like mastering engineers and mixed engineers. I didn't really do any, haven't worked with any huge artists at that time, but, um, but, but at any, at any, at any rate, <laughs> uh, let's see, then, um, uh, that that led me to the DPDO stuff, mm-hmm. the, the the legal. I completely forget that you've done that. Like you were in and out of DPDO. <laughs> yeah, this man. guy took over. T- correct me if I'm wrong. Took over DPDO, and then expanded to multiple more locations, and yep. was in and out in five years. Yeah, we basically uh, seven years. Seven years. Seven years. Okay. We maybe crushed. Maybe it eight. Too. I'm still kind of in. <laughs> yeah, but just helping. <laughs> but yeah, right. But um, we, uh, m- my parents were looking for like a small business that was cash flowing, kind of already doing well. Mm-hmm. So I brought up DP Dough. It's this calzones only, no pizza, calzone restaurant, 25 different types of calzones, anything you want in- inside of dough encased meats, cheeses, and vegetables. 
and uh, and it's open until like four a.m. So when you're a freshman, it's the sign of independence. Like your mom would not think it was reasonable or okay for you to order like a buffalo chicken calzone at two forty-five a.m. But you can. It's a thing you can do, and it's on all. Ca- it's on a ton of campuses. It's right? on a lot. Yeah, yeah, we when we bought it. There were so, so anyway, so we, we were franchisees of one we bought my parents bought one restaurant in Athens, Ohio. And I was like a minority partner with them. And we got frustrated because the founder of the of the brand was uh, basically it was hard for us to reach him. We, we we couldn't update our hours or change our menu or anything like that. So we my my dad and I went to uh, where this guy was from, Amherst, Massachusetts, and staked out a P.O. box listening to John, to John Grisham books and eventually <laughs> found him and said, hey, we're your franchisees in Athens, Ohio. We'd like to talk to you about buying the, the brand. And he was like, I don't know. <laughs> uh-huh, <laughs> to, let's sure. just say. So we stayed there for five days. And uh, yeah, it was quite interesting. And ultimately, after six months of negotiating, we went from owning one unit to owning the entire DPDO brand, which was 24 stores at the time. Wow. They all had different cheeses and marineras, totally disjointed, different menus, no no common out. Different supply chains? Yeah, the, like just totally different restaurants? The or? franchisor was just, um, you know, it w- wasn't like actively involved just loose. In, in franchising. Yeah. It was just sure. one person. It was just one person, and he didn't really provide many services at the mm-hmm. time, you know, so. But, but we... Uh, we kind of built it out into a real franchise, which was a fun process to do with my mom and dad. It was me and my mom and dad and our manager in Athens and another guy. And, um, you know, basically, uh, t- we closed down seven stores. We, we had one store where, um, I'm not going to say the location, but we had one store where the owner was forcing his employees to take Scientology thetan level tests. <laughs> Have I ever told you this story? No, no, no. Please do, though. <laughs> Bro. Oh, my gosh. Okay. <laughs> so uh, we, we're, we go, we're talking to this guy, because he, hadn't, he, he like hadn't been paying royalties to the prior owner, and we're like, hey, my, my dad and I went around to every single store, and we're like, it's like, you know, my dad used to work at Verizon Wireless. Mob, so mob style. It's sure. like former corporate executive <laughs> and his l- attorney son. Like, uh-huh. you know, people, I think, thought we were vicious animals. But we, we, we were pretty nice, I think. But at any rate, so we're talking to this guy. We're like, hey, so you owe this much money, but we're going to waive all that as long as you pay, pay us going forward. So we're good then, mm-hmm. <laughs> basically. Um and, you know, so we had this meeting, we're talking about kind of the future, and then we see this chart, and it's a bunch of names, and it's just different numbers. And, you know, one of the common things you look at in the delivery business, back when in-house delivery was a thing, excuse me, uh, back when in-house delivery was a thing, is the, your delivery return times. Mm-hmm. Like, how long are your drivers gone before they come back? On at, like divided by how many deliveries they took, like what's the average? Because that tells you like how efficient they are. Are they like fucking yeah. around doing yeah, other sure. things? And um, that's what we thought this was. I was like, oh, cool. So your driver return times are really all over the place. This because it was like going up, and you're like, oh, there's some a lot of outliers. What is this? Mm-hmm. And he's like, no, no, th- these are the thetan levels of my employees. Like. <laughs> Oh my god! And I go, what? He's like, well, we have to obviously be careful how we stay. You don't want to staff people whose levels aren't, you know, d- don't complement oh one another. Oh my goodness! And, and I, I was gonna say, where is this? Though? Don't tell me. I could be, a pro- <laughs> I could be like approximately confusing some of the. This is what I remember him saying. Uh-huh. But I, anyway, so we're at that point. We we're just like, hey, it's probably not going to work out, but we hope you have a good one. <laughs> <laughs> to the man, to the boss. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we're like, you pr- you're not allowed to, to force a religion on, on sure. people. <laughs> I don't know if you know about that. So he's like bringing them into work and like hold these things and asking questions and I like had a machine. So. And I didn't witness that. I just saw the output of it in the oh form of this gosh. chart. I and mean, that's what he told me it was. Oh my God. Uh, so, so <laughs> Have you ever done it? Huh? Have you ever done it? Have you ever no, have you? The, yeah, I, I did it once on Hollywood. We went in on Hollywood Boulevard. Uh, oh. They have the Scientology place and they have people standing out front like waving. Like, like if you make eye contact, they're like, "Come on in!" And then next thing you know, we were like, "Yeah, let's do it." And I think Jamie and I, a couple other people, can went you and believe sat down. that L. Ron Hubbard got away with that? Yeah, that's like. I mean, I'm. I can't believe on that level though that I, it's still yeah, going. I'm, I mean, 
Is it still going? They, have, yeah, still, have, they still, still have going. the real estate. They, yeah, they, I mean, it's still Tampa, right? Tampa or Dunedin, it's down there. They have the, uh-huh. uh, it's it where Bill, Bill, Billy Mays like drove by it all the time. Uh-huh. And I would like, he's like, here, we'd be on the phone. He'd be like, passing the Scientology building or whatever it yeah. was. And they'd have people out front protesting all the time. But yeah, I do. I'm, I'm not surprised by a lot anymore. I've, I, like, even like all the UFO and alien stuff coming out right now, mm. there's a meme. Uh, that's like the alien landed, and then the alien says like, "Hey," to the to a regular person, and the person's like, "Hey," and then the alien's like, "Aren't you shocked?" <laughs> and then the person responds like, "No, I've got a lot going on." Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Like that's how I feel. Like it just feels like of there's course. so much going on that it's like, of course, people are lining up to get attention and yeah, and be told what's wrong with them. Like that's what people want anyway is to be told what's wrong with them usually. Exactly. So. Yeah, they 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 have. It does seem that the, you know, sometimes the uh, prevailing wisdom about a topic suddenly changes, Phew. and you go, huh? I wonder what the implications of that change are. You know, remember the the governor of Arizona? I don't. I think it was in the early two thousands. Had, he had said that he saw the uh, Phoenix Lights. It was in maybe oh nine. There's a big triangular yeah. uh, black UFO this. that yep. all these people saw. That said they saw. There's all this video of it, and he was like, "No, that def- I was an alien spacecraft. We saw it." And then everyone there was an outcry, so he had to call a press conference where he came out wearing an alien mask as a joke, and then and then he took the mask off and he's like, "I'm just kidding." It's just, oh and everyone's God. like, "Okay, you're forgiven. You're you're forgiven yeah. for being kooky because now you made a joke and acknowledged yeah, it." Yeah, sure. And it was like you lauded it as like, "Wow, what a, this, this is like PR 101. What a what a great shining example." And it's like, wait a minute. He re- retracted something that he probably believes, and it's like now that's they're saying that yeah. the, this, the same people that discovered the uh, the little tic tac thing, I, I think, are the ones that wrote this most yep. recent article. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think my take on it is that aliens have visited the the uh, Earth for sure. Uh, like, like, I just think Roswell they printed all the stuff mm-hmm. and then they retract it. So like I think Roswell was a thing. Yeah. I and there's a too. bunch of people. Sure. And then uh and then after that, the question is how many of them are us? Mm-hmm. And and like I just, you know, <laughs> we don't have to go super far down the John Podesta uh uh <laughs> conversation. <laughs> but but when he's the main guy quarterbacking the and I look, I love Blink 182's early records. Love it. Damn it. Well, my so high crazy. school band used about to cover that. Keep going. But um like when John Podesta is the guy going, there's aliens, I'm telling you, it makes me go, they want us to think there's aliens. Mm-hmm. They, the royal they. Whatever it is, yeah. <laughs> so I got some news yesterday. I might edit this out. Maybe I yeah. won't. We'll see how it goes. Uh, a friend of mine who you know uh, told me some information. I won't say mm-hmm. names because I don't want to mm-hmm. implicate them, but that uh, uh, somebody they work for talked on the phone to not the whistleblower. The whistleblower called on the phone. It's like, hey. I know that you're reading my things. I know you know what's going on. In the write-ups, it says that I did not see them myself. I am now going to add in the third party on this call that saw the things themselves for you to talk to directly. This happened yesterday. Patch in the call. Now this guy is telling a person we both know well. You know, I think you know who I'm talking about. Uh-huh. Um, that they have seen multiple types of spacecraft uh, that work and they have they themselves conversed with two different alien species um one of which is i I don't remember the details of the other but one the details of this are the grays Mm -hmm. and the grays according to this guy live to be just over 800 years old they go through three life three growth cycles in their life they start off very small and then they go through a medium size and their final stage is where they're eight feet plus tall and that is their exit cycle. They are mm. growing. They grow too big, and it becomes a problem for their anatomy, and they end up passing. Um, all of this conversation culminated into a, a, I'm quoting, exact quote, a reckoning is coming to Earth, and it's coming in 2035. <laughs> and that everybody in the government knows this, and that this is... Uh, been hidden and then talked about and planned how to leak it. And the channels that it's currently being leaked through make me feel very much like 
it could be either way. It could be a super psyop because it is coming from the top down. But when it's coming from every angle and it's Tucker Carlson's talking about it and uh, and also I'm going um, to visit some friends uh, here later at the end of this month. If I say where and when, it'll uh-huh. give away everything. But uh, and then you bring up what Blink One Eighty Two. Where it's at, we're going to a Blink One Eighty Two concert oh. that Saturday night, <laughs> and um, and uh, it's very strange that you threw all that into one bucket. And then, and I had this response for you, but I I don't know how I feel. You know, I've you had experience. I watched the spaceship leave Earth, and when I was a young man. And that's what I try to explain to people is it's very weird having conversations with other people that say things. And like now that my story is out on my Twitter and stuff, I always am like hesitant to uh, trust people initially because I feel like, what if they just saw my shit that I posted and they're just feeding me my own mm-hmm. echo chamber? And, what, and like, that's never what I'm looking for. So I'm always um, aware that that's a possibility, but I don't give a shit. The bottom line is I watch something leave and I can't live my life in a way in which I didn't see that thing happen. It has affected my life so thoroughly that I will never live a day without taking this in. I think about it all the time. I think about it a hundred times a day. I cannot progress in my life or do anything without that. It's like, it's like I have a son on the way. Every thought that I have now is considering my son that'll be here in October. Yeah. Every decision, everything I do, every dollar I spend... It is the same fucking thing with the spaceship I saw leave Earth. I know for a fact that jets aren't shit. I know that Elon is building retarded tech. That's he's like trying to shoot big dicks in space by exploding <laughs> things. And like I know for one hundred million percent fact, nobody can tell me otherwise. I don't give a fuck what anybody thinks. That tech ain't it. Uh-huh. That is some. World War II, 1932 tech, not even the end of World War II. We're talking early World War II. By the end of World War II, we had spaceships, is what I believe. And whether they came because we were making nukes or they came for some other reason, I know that I saw something that is not a space, uh, a plane or a spaceship like we've been told. I watched something that is not uh, withheld by the physics here. Well, let's talk about this reckoning yeah, 20, I don't know. That's 20, all there 35. was. There was no details given. It was just, and that's it, that my buddy was like, he's like, I just bought a fucking house. He's like, you got a kid on the way. He's only going to be 12. I'm like, I'm like, I'm not concerned. Just keep going. Just let's just keep going. It doesn't, I mean, what's, what are, yeah. what are we going to be concerned about? Like, you might as well be concerned that like the stock market's going to crash. Like, no, the, there's, there, there are more things way to be more, concerned about yes, in the near term. I mean, yes, yes. I mean, we're the, the, <laughs> You know, we're on the verge of a nuclear war, and and if you say anything whatsoever uh, to to raise that possibility, you are coded as right wing. Yeah, yeah. cool society. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, uh, it's very interesting to me that you like you as you were telling about Crumpton Legal. You say I was very uh, pro establishment, and I remember you from this time. You were you were the attorney that I looked at as like, this man is by the fucking book. Like this guy will not let anything go down that is not out. And that's what I wanted. You know, that's exactly, I wanted that. And that I came to you with the highest recommendations of this guy is the fucking king. He's the best lawyer, top of his class, everything. That's what everybody was saying. And I come to you and you're like, yes, we fucking like buy the book, buy these, this is what we do. (laughs) And now to know you 15 years later, it's like you're a completely different person as far as, as far as your outlook, but you're still a very structured and um, line drawing person. Like you, yeah. you really set boundaries. You set boundaries for yourself and expectations for yourself, and really crush those and stay within those boundaries. Of like you're not, you're not out here searching for new friends and like trying out new groups of people. Like you mm-hmm. know where you want to be and where you fit, and that. And you're also right now like. I don't want to say fuck establishment, but you are on. I mean, you're on the solving JFK podcast. Yeah. So, like, I, I uh, you know, the long story short, <laughs> the, my my path was basically a, a couple of things happened. I would say like three things. Three things happened that made me uh, be. Let's say, see, politics has a whole different connotations, but let's. Just, I, I used to be like a moderate Republican. Like I voted for Mitt Romney, mm-hmm. okay, <laughs> and John McCain. 
Like I was like super moderate Republican and I was like very pro war also mm -hmm. because I believed all the things they were saying. You know what I mean? Was this Iraq and like everything Afghanistan? Whatever and, whatever yeah, whatever that. came out of the uh you know, the, the PR shop at the Department of Defense and the Department of State, I was like, well, it's true because we're saying it. <laughs> mm -hmm. You can basically, I, I, I used to be what is now considered like a neo lib, mm -hmm. but it was different back then. It was like a, a mainstream Republican because <laughs> it, it's, it's bizarre. But, but at, at, any, at any rate, I mean, social issues confuse, confuse things, but that's basically the point. Everybody that started the Iraq war lives on MSNBC now. That's weird. Right, right. <laughs> okay. So um, I would say getting laid off from my big corporate law firm where I crushed and I did well. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, basically it was just a numbers game and I ended up having to do a bunch of pro bono work that I didn't have a choice but to do. Mm -hmm. And I um, didn't get credit for it, basically. So they just cut the bottom, you know, bottom four lowest hours that were billable. Well, I had like 900 non-billable hours I didn't want to do. That's why I got like, so, so that made me rather disillusioned. Uh, I would say I wasn't thrilled about making, you know, one third of the money that I had been making. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so that was just kind of like, oh, you can't trust anyone. Okay. It's everybody's out for themselves. And then I started to have some success individually and I'm like, good, I don't need them. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And even though I was like, I got up to making like half of what I was making, mm -hmm. I was like, I'm crushing. You know what yeah, I mean? You, and you were. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure. Like, I'm like, this 1998 Honda Civic is paid for. <laughs> yes. Yes. Hey, paid for is good. Don't be hate. I'm, I'm looking at car payments right now and I'm like, I don't think I want that. I'd rather keep the Camry. Yeah, man. But uh, but anyway, um, so that's the one thing I would say. Getting laid off that made me a little bit anti-establishment, less trusting. The second thing is my experiences with DPDO, which mm -hmm. I'll come back to here in a second. But my experiences of just like, especially interacting with government entities across the United States at at, at every, not really the federal level, but the state and local level, mm -hmm. and it just seems so arbitrary. It's like the BMV is everywhere. So that sort of drove me to. Um, like the libertarian side of things and to like to consider arguments that I previously would have been like, okay, but we need services. Like the government does things. We need roads, blah, blah, blah. Okay, yeah, sure, we need roads. But like, do we need, you know, do we need all these other things? I don't know. And then, uh, but the main thing, so so far that's like 15% of the recipe. But here's the main thing. I started studying deep politics. Mm -hmm. Like I started studying things like, you know, the JFK assassination and COINTELPRO and... um the, all of the different adventurism that the CIA had. I, I, I have a little merch company called Gadfly Gear, and I'm doing no promotion for it because I wasn't allowed to on Facebook. My Facebook advertising, Facebook and Instagram ad account is shut down because of this store. What? Okay, and it doesn't even say anything. It's literally like true things from American history. So, so this one shirt, it's amazing. It looks like Metallica. Uh, the um, like this Metallica album cover. I can't think of what it, what it is, but instead of saying Metallica, it says Alan Dulles, <laughs> and it's got a picture of him like uh, holding the world in his hand, and on the back it says CIA uh, World Tour, and it says oh uh, coup or cooperate, and then it just lists the year, the country, and the dictator that we overthrew or oh whether it was failed. Oh my gosh, that's a great shirt. It's excellent shirt. It's I, I may relaunch it again. Why but, not? Yeah, I mean, are you I Shopify? Keep, Shopify keep, store for this? Uh, we go through. Uh, we go through uh, Jerry's guy. Okay, yeah, yeah, uh, but, you got your own shit. Yeah, yeah. 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 But um, but basically, uh, so yeah, I, I just I did. I started to really look into information, and then I, you know, I travel the country with a, another guy we know who is, let's call them a conspiracy theorist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he would always say things to me and I would say, that's ridiculous. That's you're going to embarrass the company mm -hmm. by saying that. And you're going to, you're, that reflects poorly on me that you think these kooky, insane things that can't be true. <laughs> and then, and then he, to his credit, <laughs> issue by issue, he would go, well, can you just like Give me some information to prove me wrong. You're a lawyer. Like, 
set me on the right path. Yeah, I don't cast wanna, a spell that changes my mind. I don't want to think this. Yes, yeah. And I'm like, okay, send me the. I'm like, I will. I will entertain your your crazy ideas just to prove them wrong. Yeah. And so I set out to like research. I I, uh, I remember opening the Word doc on my computer. Here we go. This is the document I'm going to debunk you every single th- crazy thing that you said. Oh my gosh. And just I, friendly. This is friendly. We're just doing this friendly. As, homies. This yeah, is yeah. in a this is in a uh, a hotel in Storrs, Connecticut. <laughs> <laughs> Yukon. Mm. I remember it well because I woke up the next morning with a hum in my head, like, oh my God. Like, so basically, yeah, I spent one night in, in Storrs, Connecticut, researching like the history of the United States, every mm-hmm. controversial thing that, you know, Alex Jones says. And and I learned that a number of those things, more than half, are very totally true. true. <laughs> yeah. And then I was true. like, what are we doing? Uh-huh. Elections are fake. Everything's fake. And I don't mean like whatever the, the Trump election stuff I'm saying yeah, is like fake votes. It's all the whole thing. What the I whole mean, thing is a What shred. I mean is we yeah. live in a uh, an oligarchic duopoly. Yeah. Where you have the left wing of the bird and the right wing of the bird, but it's the same bird, bird. baby. Yeah. As Ice T said yes. on Twitter recently. The wings flap together. <laughs> We're going together. Yeah. And so, you know, it's not, there's no real options, really. Y- your options are what flavor do you want? Mm-hmm. What flavor of the of oligarchic empire would you like to digest? Would you like the conservative cherry? Or would you like the neoliberal blue? I'm sorry, we're all out of the progressive purple. You're not allowed to have any of that. Uh, you can have wars uh, in blue uh, and that that support that, that are extremely supportive of LGBTQ. Uh, or you can have wars in red that are only supportive of LGB. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. This is. Those I, are your choices. I resonate with this a what lot. Cho- right what now, color actually. would, what flavor would you like your uh-huh. your empire, defense, and war? Uh-huh. In? So I love when people are like the man. So the man, of, you know, when people find out what I think about the world, they go, "So you voted for Trump?" And I go, "Trump should be in the Hague." <laughs> <laughs> and then, the, and then they're just totally. What do you? How do you? What do you do? Yeah, yeah. That's a yeah. Sli- I'm so slippery. slippery. <laughs> you are slippery. <laughs> yeah, so you're all over. But you you seem to be all over. But you have a real. It, you feel all over, but it does when you're when I'm with you and speak with you. It feels like you have a solid position. You do have a solid. You're not really all over, mm-hmm. although your beliefs go in and out of different things, or you're you'll point at different things as a, a reference. Mm-hmm. But you're you're a very stable yeah. man. Yeah, I mean, man. I just think uh, you know. Uh, I think that you should be able to say. This, uh, you know, I disagree with this person about this thing, but it doesn't mean I can't talk to them about this other thing. Yeah. And also, if I don't disagree with them about that thing, what are you going to do to me? Yeah. What are you going to do? Now, some things are bad, okay? But I'm saying, like, you know, it's this whole, like, judging people based on their associations. Yeah. I try to fight out against that just because I, I reject that in principle. And so, so basically, anything that is... You see this with Russell Brand. You see it with Jimmy Dore. You see it with... You know, like Aaron Maté, all these people that are pretty much independent media, uh, and they're they're coming from the progressive left. They're like all Bernie Sanders supporters. They're you know, anytime they're discussed in corporate press, they're they're called right wing. Really? Yeah, they're called right wing. The guys you just named are considered yeah. right wing. Yeah, Russell Brand, right wing. Really? Yeah. Because, I mean, that's just what... Google right-wing Russell Brand. I guarantee you'll get a bunch of articles. Wow. I would never yeah. picture him. I would never say, like, Russell Brand. I would say well, the op- it's, it's, almost the opposite is what my my image projection is. Sorry, Russell. If, 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 I don't know. It's because anybody who says anything that is not directly in line with the current story, the current, the current thing, regime, yeah, uh, is going to get pushback. You know? I mean, even, like, Jon Stewart... When he's so he's he's on Colbert and he agrees with them with on every single point and he goes except for like you know it came from Wuhan it's in the mm-hmm. he like lays out the points of kind of what's well, kind of like well it's that's he that's Occam's razor is that that's where it came from and then he got all this pushback just because on that one little tiny issue you know what I mean mm-hmm. like so I just think like that's when another reason I enjoy doing the podcast is because when I started looking at the my podcast solving JFK. When I started looking at the JFK community of people who are researching it, uh, I found that like there's not really debate in good faith. Each side just hates each other. Hmm. 
But they don't eat. But and I also sort of saw and like thanks the other size idiots. Like you're just not paying attention to this one thing. So I dislike you because you're yes not smart enough to take this as There's this a, seat of truth or whatever. A lot of name calling. A hmm. lot of name calling. Maybe more name calling. How big of a circle is this? How like how many individuals? I'm would in you like say? seven or eight. JFK assassination Facebook discussion groups, mm-hmm. and each of them have between four to ten thousand people. Wow, in them. wow! And I haven't. What's funny? I haven't even dropped my podcast in there. I None of them. I, I'm waiting for someone else to bring it up. That's I want amazing. someone else to drop That's it. I want to come across it. No one has yet, but they, um, they will. But uh, well, I kind of see. I do rebuttals. I allow people to send stuff in. I'm afraid they're going to flood me. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's fine. I, I still would. get to pick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, but basically. What I'm trying to do is identify split points and inferences, and it's the same thing in politics. So it's like, okay, you know, JFK assassination. You come to a point where you go, well, there's a lot of things in conclu- things that are inconclusive, and you're like, man, I really don't know. That's tough. It could be this. It could be that. It depends on the credibility of the witnesses, and we don't really we need to know more. You know, whatever. But um, are there are there a lot of attorneys? Are like, is there anybody coming at this from like a legal? Like, nah. I feel like you're coming at it from a pretty unique standpoint yeah. of like, you went to law school. You are being trained on arguing both sides. Like mm. you're the type of guy that could argue either side yeah, of anything, yeah, yeah. given proper time to right. prepare. And like, is are you finding a lot of people that are well versed on both sides, or are is your experience that they're like holding on to a belief as opposed mm. to facts? Like, no, people choose a side and then they stop. Mm. It's, it's extremely rare to encounter someone who. Uh, uh, who doesn't have pre-existing beliefs that are really strong? Huh. Um, so, so it just that's just what I've seen from it. Uh-huh. Um, what I was going to say is like it, it really just comes down to inferences. So like the most famous, like the first split point is which one's more likely? It's just a poll. You pick which one's. Here, here's your choices. Option A is that uh, uh, 43 witnesses who said there was a hu- a gaping wound in the right rear of Kennedy's head. Uh, are, what we all would say we saw or right. have seen the video. So of. do you yeah. believe those 43 witnesses or do you believe the autopsy and the x-rays and the photos? You have to pick one or the other. It's binary. So what's more likely that 43 people all said the same thing and were mistaken or that there's forgery in the evidence? Hmm. And people go, damn, I don't know, 43 people. And then the next question is, well, is there any evidence to support forgery? And there's a shit ton. There's eight things. Wow. I go through. Okay. Like none of the pictures match up. Uh-huh. Uh, the, they bring in the photographers. It's they ask them, do these photos represent the ones you took? And they go, no, it's nothing like the ones I took. The cerebellum uh, is perfect in this one. And the ones I took, it was totally destroyed. Uh, this has a picture from the bottom. I've never taken a picture of the bottom of a brain. I used Ansco film. Oh, that's a different uh. type of film. The lady who developed the film came in and she brought the paper. She's like, I took original paper from me as a souvenir when I left so that I, now I have have a copy of the exact type of paper that I would have uh, used to develop it, wow. so we can see it's in the same batch. So we'll just confirm that it's the same the same batch. This is a totally different type of paper. Oh, it is. Yeah. So is she so she's just straight up lying. No, 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 no. She she's she said that she's telling the truth. The other t- the other paper is the four. It doesn't match it. Yeah. Wow. She's, she she's under oath. I yeah. took it. I took this to yeah. have a souvenir. Basically. Yeah. She's the only one that's now. Wow. She, anybody could be lying, I guess, at any point. But yeah, yeah. But um, but so these people all testify before the assassination records review board under oath, and we have all that. So so that's oh my gosh. that's what I'm going. Look, this this this, and then so, so that's why I land on ultimately the conspiracy side. Now the question is, what are the granular details? And that's that's also what I'm working on. That's another project. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's going to be mm-hmm. going. I think I'm going to have at least three seasons. Are you? Yeah. Are, are you already on two? Are you working on two yet? Two. Uh, so season one right now we we've gotten through. Like just super high level, we've gotten through the stuff inside the school book depository. Could he have been in place? How did he get the gun in? The records behind the gun, um, him leaving the school book depository, uh, him as a shooter. Like was was he a good shooter? Like the mechanics of the shots that would have had to go off. We did four episodes on Dealey Plaza and all the witnesses and the people. You actually went there too, right? I you went, went there, and yeah. walked, and I think you told me like you walked the distance of Dude. like from wherever to the library. Uh-huh. Tell, tell me more about that. Like, what was that experience like? Oh man, when I went to Dallas, uh, I um, well, first of all, let me come right back to that. Yeah, but yeah, just yeah. because that's a whole <laughs> separate story. So. Uh, we're on season. You're talking about season two and season three. Yeah. So, so, so the rest of season one, we have um, 
uh, Dealey Plaza. Then we did seven episodes on the medical evidence. This is a lot, and they're just dense. That's why I have the music because, like, it's dense Mm -hmm. stuff. So then I'm like, "How about a 15 second instrumental?" (laughs) Um, But uh, but anyway, so now we're doing Officer Tippett, the murder of JD Tippett, and that's kind of like all the cops like we're like, "Oh, you killed our our brethren. We're gonna storm you, or whatever." In the Texas theater, and that's Oswald supposedly killed Tippett, and there's a bunch of eyewitnesses that say that he did nine. Wow. But the eyewitness, uh, and actually, when I say not, I think it's only like four actually identified his face as the guy. Mm -hmm. But they did it in a lineup where everybody had to say their name and where they worked. And he goes, Lee Lee Oswald, Texas School Book Depository. And everybody knew that the president was shot from the depository that day. Right. So, yeah. (laughs) And he had a black eye. Pretty leading. Yeah. (laughs) So, so anyway, but so it it ends up being like a Rorschach test. But anyway, sorry. um, uh, The rest of the season, then we go to Texas Theater. Oswald's arrested. Jack Ruby. Okay. Jack Ruby shoots him. Then season two is uh, who was Oswald really? Because we got to do a deeper dive on Oswald. We look at all season one's like we're looking at all the other just like the evidence. Like what is the evidence? What happened? What is the evidence? Season two is well, what like okay if Oswald did it like what were his motives? Like what's his background? Like, what what's he into? Could he really sh- could he really shoot? What did the people say that were around him? He learned how to speak Russian. When specifically did he learn how to speak Russian? Mm-hmm. How did he? How did his family come to live with this woman, uh, uh, Ruth Payne? You know, whose whose sister was an active CIA agent, whose father was uh, worked for USAID, which is lived a CIA, with the sister of an uh, active CIA active agent. CIA agent. Father was USAID, uh, uh, which is a CIA cutout, and uh, uh, the mother's best friend was Alan Dulles's mistress. Holy shit! That's who yeah. Oswald's wife lived with, Ruth Payne. How, and is this is any of this new? Like, are you uncovering new stuff, or is pretty is this is this known and being uh, compiled in a new way or presented in a new way? Like, have you are you seeking this out from known JFK sources, or are you digging into some different places and adding new nuggets to mm. this to this path? I'm uh, I'm not doing any original research so far, mm-hmm. um, but. You know, well, it is original research. You're recombing the right. research that's been done. And I there's am. Years. I mean, there's fifty. How many years now? Sixty yeah, years. Yeah. I think what I'm good at is figuring out what the average person's going to be able to digest and what the angle is, mm-hmm. and like kind of getting to the point. You know. And now part of that's because I have a written script. Mm-hmm. I think people are pretty disappointed when they hear me talk <laughs> live. I don't think so. After they hear my my. I don't think so. My my. my you know the the produced podcast. I sound what well, has to be because if you didn't, you'd be this would be a, a ten year project, <laughs> yeah. and you'd be on year three and year six yeah, yeah. because you'd be talking sidetracked and rambled or tangents. I, I wish my voice was as dramatic and awesome in real life as it is in the produced versions of my <laughs> podcasts. <laughs> do you do you talk differently on purpose? Like, are you looking to have that vibe only at the end of segments? Okay. Okay. At the end of segments, I do so that mm-hmm. I can. Uh, basically, my vibe is I'm giving an argument to the court. Yes, and I'm and you can like my hands. You can ask Jerry like I'm moving my hands like I'm preaching. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm yeah, giving yeah. this yes. argument, and then and then I go into like Robert Stack unsolved mysteries voice on the transition mm-hmm. paragraphs. Let's go into another Robert. What do you think about this RFK Jr. and like Ooh. what? what I, I I don't even want to. I don't want to give any. Uh, I don't want to give any of my mm. my energy on it. I just want to yeah. know, like, what are your thoughts on what's going on right now and who he is and what his future yeah. looks like? Yeah, uh, I my primary thought is that his voice precludes him from having a chance. Really? <clears throat> Unfortunately. I would like to think that that's not true. I would, too. But people are terrible, and, they, and that's just, I think, ultimately, they're going to... But look, you know, they've got Biden in there, so... But, you know, RFK, I, uh, I mean... I like RFK Jr. Mm-hmm. I would vote for RFK Jr. in a second. A- I would I would work for RFK Jr. I would also work for Dave Smith mm. if uh, if he ends up running. So I'm just I'm in favor of whoever the outsider is who has the best chance of winning. So whoever's not uh, the like okay, let's see what we have in the Republican Party. We have we have Trump, who's we all know the things about Trump, and like my my quick thought on Trump is that. He, I, I concede that he's everything that that his critics say he is. He, all the worst things. He's all those sure. things. Yes. 
And but I also understand how someone could vote for him just because he's a Molotov cocktail. Who like Trump has made uh, the left um, really love and defend the FBI and the CIA just because they're they're persecuting him. You know what I mean on things that they that are all made up. So like I think Trump's a piece of garbage. Like I think he's all the bad things people say. I agree with. But even so, anybody who's in there like. It's like, would you elect a uh, uh, a honey badger? Remember the honey badger? Yeah. I would love for a honey badger to go into the heart of the federal government and just claw and destroy. <laughs> and and the thing is, you know, <laughs> Trump. That's what Trump is. Trump is like a honey badger. But but the problem is, he's not. He's all. Uh, He's all sizzle and no steak. Sure. Like literally, he tried to have Trump steaks, which is kind of funny. Oh but like, gosh. but um, but 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 so yeah, I don't like think he's like smart or good, and I I, I vote libertarian. But but at, at any rate, um, back to RFK Jr. Uh, um, I I think that he's he takes the outsider position on literally everything, and you know the the thing I don't understand or agree the the, the place where I part ways with my outsider uh, leftist friends. Because here's the thing, Cam, and you know this. Once you're an outsider, once you go, this whole political conversation is based on lies, propaganda, and just weaponized gullibility. Yes. Okay? And once you step out of that, you look around, and once you go right far enough, you end up left. And once yeah. you go left far enough, like it's just... There's outs- no spectrum. It's a circle. <laughs> Outsiders yeah. end up being kind of together. The spectrum is a circle. Um, so, so I, I think it's good that he takes those positions. I mean, on the, the vaccine stuff, I, I don't know about, uh, uh, I just don't know enough about other vaccines, um, aside from the COVID vaccine, but I know that, you know, at a minimum things that we were told about it aren't true, right? We know that uh, it, it didn't stop transmission. Mm-hmm. A Cleveland Clinic study of 51,000 people who came into the hospital, this is post-Omicron, which came out a few months ago, um, showed there's a directly inverse correlation between how many COVID shots you've had and whether you were hospitalized. So in other words, the least are people who didn't have any shots, and the most are people that had five shots, and it and it played out exactly that over a fifty one thousand sample size survey. Wow. So conclusively, just a disaster. So it was not effective at all. What was it safe? And now, and the thing is, people will still say that it was. Mm-hmm. I go, I go, like, look, this is a study from the like. Help me understand the definition of of what uh an expert is like in in law there's something called a i think it's a dobbs test and there's like a standard to expert to be an expert you have to like there's like four different things you have to meet but people who were heads of you know medical departments uh ivy league schools the guy that was the the main uh the doctor at stanford um uh medical school also came out of against a lot of the measures with COVID and they were, you know, they signed this thing called the great Barrington declaration and they were basically viewed as kooks and crazy and they were tried to be shunned. I mean, they're kicked off of platforms, you know, they're called anti-vaxxers. These are, these are experts. So what would happen? The guy who made MRNA vaccines was kicked off platforms. Like in a, in a functioning society, you would say, "Oh no, this is we're gonna have a scientific debate." I disagree with with Dr. Malone about this issue, and he and and so they would get together and debate, and they would present their information, and and because they're both experts, like we we you can't change the definition of an expert because they reach a yeah. different substantive yeah, opinion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so to me, this is like dark ages stuff, and and you know, and this is something that further rad. This is what made me super radical. This this it made me to the point where I'm like. I would rather lose friends over this, and I hope to lose friends mm-hmm. because just to weed out people that that are like I can't be around people that are th- dangerous intentionally. Yes, um, I agree. You know, I lost whatever. some friends over it. I um, actually I won't mention any names, um, but I am just rekindling a friendship uh, with someone, and it's really tough for me to do because of the energy that was shared during mm. the height of COVID. And basically their energy was like anybody who's not vaccinated, you don't, you shouldn't get hospital care. You shouldn't even be allowed to go to the hospital. Uh-huh. Let, them, let them die. Yeah. Uh, fuck them and their families. Like these idiots, they don't deserve to have health care. Mm-hmm. They don't deserve to be a part of this society. And I, 
I'm not an expert by any stretch of the imagination, but I've studied World War II a lot, and I've I spent a couple years paying attention to World War II stuff. Literally, that's all I did. Like watched every documentary, read mm -hmm. read things, and just everything I could to get a grasp on. Um, I was, I wanted to be able to have conversations about World War II and not be a an idiot mm -hmm. in the conversation. And it's so apparent to me how COVID is very parallel to World War II energy of it. W it was yeah, it was. It's basically like Nazism all over again of people pointing out their friends and families and saying like, right. if you're not going to do this, then you're not with us. And then, and then people, and then what was crazy to me is that that metaphor you just used, which is a metaphor. Okay. Right. It's a metaphor. You're not saying they aren't, you're not saying it's the same. I was actually calling them straight. I was like, <laughs> no, these people are actually Nazis and they would. And I, I do believe, I still believe that had we existed in that time, they would be boots on the ground, yeah. strapped up, ready to go of, we got to put these people that aren't doing this in cages. And that's where it's hard to, it's hard, with the sun coming into the world and knowing that mm -hmm. people do come to power unexpectedly sometimes, how do you have a friend or how do you maintain a relationship with somebody that you know they were very serious. Their whole heart was in the statements they were making, mm -hmm. and they were saying, "Kill these people," to right. about their family and f former friends and things. And like, how can you be with somebody? How can you build a life with them when that was the energy they gave? Wh whether they are apologizing for it now or not, it's like so are the like Adidas is out here running a, a global brand selling black culture. They were literally founded by a Nazi. They're, they mm -hmm. funded Nazis. They donated money. They made shoes. They were friends with Adolf. Like, this is, it's like, just because somebody says they're right, sorry, exactly. it's like, when you get the opportunity again, you would still fucking cage me and poke me and prod me or gas right. me or whatever the fuck it is that I'm not doing, you would get me in line with your right. regime. And how do I forget, how can I forget that and move forward? It's like... It's because, it's because they were so susceptible to uh, believing that people who made a choice were other. And they also thought, truly, they truly believed in their hearts that people who made the choice to not get vaccinated, whether they had had COVID or not, if they'd had COVID, clearly, then it's not a problem. Like, shut up. <laughs> if mm -hmm. they had had COVID, right. or whatever, they didn't want to read any of the studies. Mm -hmm. But people who chose to not get vaccinated, uh, they thought that they, were, they, they had this choice, and they made that choice, and they made the, did the right thing, even though they had to like be sick for a day. So somebody else should do it, or they should get punished, especially if they're going to hurt other people. I did it. You should have to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. That's mm -hmm. that. That was sort of the vibe, um, and they succeeded in that, and in in making those people be like basically criminals, like be like the heel. Mm -hmm. Now those people, interestingly, were looking at data. You know, when when you uh, I remember seeing a survey came out that it was like, uh, it was uptake of the, uh, it was vaccine hesitancy and it was by, by education level. Yeah. And so the, too. the, uh, you had, you know, pretty high hesitancy for people who didn't have a, a, a high school degree, a, a little bit less hesitancy if they had a high school degree, far less if they had a college degree, mm -hmm. even less, like almost everybody master's that has up. a master's and a law degree was Vax. vaccinated, right? Yep. But once you get into PhDs, it went back to be the same as people that didn't have a high school literally diploma. Literally the, the, the meme IQ graph. It literally was that. <laughs> it was literally that. Yeah. It's like, yeah. It's a, and, and the point of that, the point of that meme is like the dumb people and the smart people believe the same thing for different reasons. Mm-hmm. You know, sure. that's, so that's, and, and I find myself in that group a all lot, the time. I, I don't know which side I'm on. A lot of times I'm like, am I, am I, am I the, the guy with the hood or am I drooling? <laughs> yeah. And usually I'm the guy drooling, but I'm okay with that. I'm fine with that. Do you like, do you, do you like being the guy with a hood or do you like being the guy sitting on your brain? Like the brain chair? Yeah, I like the flathead guy. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just, I, I usually look at myself. I mean, me and my friends, I feel, are usually on the end of the spectrum of we have the information. We're we're looking, we are all idea guys and looking for information. And yeah. so it's when there's something I need information on, it's like, well, I'm going to my group chats. I'm going to the. I'm not going to Twitter yeah. or CNN or Fox. I'm going to ask you. But I'm, I'm coming to the group chat to say, hey guys, what do you think about this? I'm. I look up to you guys as men. Yeah. What do you guys think? As men that I respect in my community with families, 
what do you guys think today? And yeah. I'm not going to make a move th- today based on what you said. We're going to take it in. We'll let some time pass and we'll reevaluate yeah. and make them some decisions. I try not to do anything quickly you know, uh-huh. anymore because I feel in time, I feel everything's true and everything's false. And like right. something you think is true today, just wait a year mm-hmm. and we'll see where it's at in a year. And we'll, we'll see. I, I don't have the answers. That's, yeah. that's my number one answer these days is I don't know. And I don't have the answers usually. Yeah, especially if you don't, if you haven't looked into something, it's good to, uh, it's good to have an open mind and say you don't know, right? There's a lot of people that don't do that. So you, they're getting ready to uh, arrest Trump today. Or Seriously, not, maybe not today. They, they, they're saying like it's imminent, like arrest, yeah. like taking him in. Well, really? What? I'm sorry. Indict. They're going not oh, again, arrest. not arrest. again. Well, no, but this time it's going to be on federal charges from for, the attorney general from the for the in, classified documents. Oh, for taking them. Yeah, it's like, dude, I guarantee you they could have cases against all the all presidents. presidents on that. Yeah, you think and they, they made up boxes? the other stuff against Trump? Like they should have gone. Like the thing I saw Chris Christie say the other day mm-hmm. was basically the main attack on Trump. Like he's a piece of shit. He did this. Remember we went to Puerto Rico and they were all starving and thirsty, and he threw out paper towels like it was a basketball oh, shot gosh, and congratulated no, himself yeah. like dude he's a piece of shit talk about that like don't don't be like you know well he, he what did he get impeached for he didn't sell the weapons fast enough to ukraine wow is that really what yeah, the, that's what he got impeached see, for I, i'm so be, tuned down because, because he wanted to hold because he goes well, let's i'm gonna hold up this weapon sale because at first i want you to look into whether or not uh, there was a prosecutor in Ukraine who was about to prosecute Joe Biden and Hunter Biden for this corruption with this energy company. The Hunter Biden's still getting paid for. Mm-hmm. Still. Yeah. And, and uh, well, he was at the time. I don't know, it, may, it may have stopped by now, sure. right? Uh, Burisma is what it's called. And this was not, this didn't even make it in the, this is the corporate news is just a fully garbage because they'll admit this yeah. is true, but they're like, it doesn't matter. Oh, it's fucking side. Mm-hmm. Like, what, what the, pre- the vice president's son can't be on a, in a, a company in Ukraine? And what? So anyway, there was a prosecutor looking into corruption for that and, and he got kicked out. He got like, they, they, they pulled him back and Trump was like, I want you to tell me what happened with that. Reopen it. And they're like, they, then they're like, oh, we're going to impeach you because you were holding up US uh, funds to uh, to politically persecute your opponent, you know your your political wow. opponent. And it's like no, there That's was a already a thing ask. going on in the yeah, Ukraine, yeah, 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 yeah. and then it was stopped. Man. Anyway, so and then you know, but look, I, I don't like the day to day of it all. See, the problem with, with caring about the day to day politics, I can't do it. Is that that presumes that there's a side that's going to win, and it yes. will be better when that side wins. Yes. And what I would rather do is undermine faith in the system and institutions generally. <laughs> I think it's pretty so, like so. How about this? My um, our buddy Colby, you know Colby, just went to Europe for the first time, and he's been over there for two weeks now, and loving it. Not only loving it, take it all, eating all, I want it all. eating all the foie gras, all of it, nonstop meats, cheeses, breads, <laughs> wines, nonstop, and he's texting us, "Hey guys, I've lost thirteen pounds." Shit. And he's like, every ingredient over here is like every everything I have is like three ingredients on a package. It's four ingredients. It's straight up like potatoes, vinegar, salt is the <laughs> potato chips. And he keeps saying, how in the fuck are we feeding people what we're feeding them in America? And that is, are we Truly. even, is America, <laughs> is it? Are we so separated as a society that there are the classes of people that literally watch the news and then there's the, a class of people that doesn't watch the news and these are the separating, these are the, the divisions here? Or is, it more, is there more minutia and more small nuance in here that is, uh, that is truly different? Like I, I just wonder if it's even possible to get to a place to where people are all agreeing on anything. It feels mm-hmm. like we yeah. are in the idiocracy time of everybody lives in their own reality. Everybody's choose their own adventure yes. and whatever's getting them through the day. And I mean, if I have family members, if they didn't watch Fox news they're you know, they'd, they wouldn't have. They may, may not be on blood pressure medication. They definitely, maybe <laughs> they, maybe they would be vaccinated, mm. but maybe not. 
Um, because that's why the fear of watching that every day is what pounded it into them of like, fuck, I got to make the appointment. I got to go do it. Yeah. I got to do it. It's nonstop. It's a, right. I got to do it. If they're just exactly. nonstop talking about it, I'm going to go do it. And like, then a year later, it's like, oh, I'm not going to get any more boosters. I'm done with that. Yeah. They Had they not been watching the news, they wouldn't even have ever done If If you just didn't have a fucking TV or didn't pay attention to radio or news, are you vaccinated today? And I would like to know like a, a full on study of like, is that what's happening? Is the indoctrination through the media is causing this to happen? And is that really a sales pitch? Or is this just a choose your own adventure and all the products are available? And if you need something to make you feel safe when the masks you're wearing literally do not work, it's literally not the mask you should be wearing, mm -hmm. but you feel smart. I mean, there's still people out here. Yesterday the I saw blue. people, there are still people out Cloth here wearing mask. fucking masks in the world, like uh -huh. walking or like their on nose the street. Out with a blue mask. It's insanity. Like, they're just signaling. That's what they're doing. Insanity. Walking down the street with a mask on by yourself is like, I don't know if. I, I my mind basically goes blank when I see them. I'm just like I can't look at this. Look at this wild animal. In, in Truly, space. There, there are two levels. There's two levels to that. There's there's the person you see that's got the, that's got the KN95 that's snugly on on their face, and you go, okay, I know who you voted for. Yep, I know how much money you make. Uh, may approximately. Well, you buy um, an expensive mask. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you have enough money for cable TV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. There's that person, and then and then you and then the other person that you see on the street with a mask is sort of just the totally misinformed person who has just been terrified of COVID, mm -hmm. but doesn't know how anything works. So that's who you see. They're they're wearing a mask, even though you don't need. This is what I saw yesterday in the parking lot. I went to a subway, but which was adjacent to a Dollar General. So I saw this person walking into the Dollar General who had a blue surgical mask mm -hmm. with her nose out. So the blue surgical mask is worthless, and having your nose out is worthless. KN95 does something kind something. of debatable, debatable. Debatable. This is intensely debatable, but it does something. Mm -hmm. So it's like if you have a good, like a intense, you're, you know, you want to wear a mask literally everywhere, then you better be wearing a KN95, or you're just yes, a joker. Just a joke. That's <laughs> absolutely. So K and I, K expecting five. Oh, we're at 21 weeks. We've been going to the Riverside down the street quite yeah. a bit. Uh, first three and a half months, mask as soon as you walk in. Uh, huge pillar, you know, mm -hmm. eight foot tall, filled with masks. You can't miss it. Uh, pull them out as you go, and then trash cans uh, both sides of the doors to throw away as you're going in and out. We went go down in the basement to the OB department. All of the employees have their masks under their nose, laughing, talking. Mm -hmm. Maybe two employees don't have a mask on at all or completely under their chin. And a girl walks in, an employee double masks twisted on the sides so they're really tight on her face they laughed at her like this is i'm talking like two months ago <laughs> and i know it's late but like this is i'm saying i'm saying two months ago in uh they they just ended the masks so uh -huh. it's, it was near the end but this person was wearing and they're everybody at the hospital's laughing at their at their colleague of like, look how much she cares about her. Like this is serious. I quote, look how much she cares about her mask. Mm -hmm. And like, she's got it twisted on and around. And she's like, yeah, we're supposed to be wearing masks. It's her energy. And they're all, all the other employees are laughing at her for taking it seriously. Yeah. And we're sitting here getting healthcare. Right. Like we're here we're to be fucking system. served by you yeah. all. And you guys can't even agree that we're here on the significance or if this is even necessary. And it's like, how am I supposed to have faith in the system? And, and this, I would say, this has been a major eye-opener for Kay and I. The amount of information and misinformation and um, different ideas we're getting just on pregnancy. Like, we were told sure. by a doctor not to lay on, she's not supposed to lay on her right side. A doctor told her that. And then we came home, we asked every, every woman in our lives... Have you ever heard not to sleep on your right side? And everybody's like, no, no, no. Who told you that? Why would they say that? No, why? And it's like, oh, well, it could pinch some vein that like cuts off circulation of the kidneys or something and like could really hurt the baby. Everybody's like, no, pregnant, just sleep how you can sleep. If, but wow. you, you can't lay on your back, of course, like yeah. after X amount of time. But like, We've been having babies for hundreds of years. We have hospitals all over. People are going to school for seven, eight years, and they can't agree right. on how you're supposed to sleep. Or There is no... 
consensus on <laughs> any of the medical field. Yeah. And it's like, how am I supposed to have any faith in anything these people are saying at all across the board? And, and where does that stop? And then you also have Eastern medicine that, that has been used for, you know, thousands ten, of years. Thousand years, yeah. And, and uh, you know... I, Million years. I, back, back to your the question you had earlier about, um, you know, fragmenting a society and what's going to happen and, uh, you know, trust the establishment. I think everything really... Like, there was... If you look at charts, there was a decline in trust in the corporate news media, like, very slow. But it was starting to happen, like... like probably right around the, the financial crisis, 2008, 2009. And I uh, remember the big scandal with Obama was his the IRS was doing extra audits for conservative nonprofits. Oh, the horror. <laughs> like it was like, like I, I guarantee you there was some other stuff going on. Yeah, that talking about. Yeah. But, um, but so what's unique about this is that historically the anti-establishment people, sure you've got your militias and you have your libertarians, but generally, anti-establishment people have been coded as like left wing, mm -hmm. like they're the hippies, they're the like anarchists or whatever. You yeah, know the what right I mean? wings are super establishment, I guess. Yeah, you're for, right. For yeah. like right wing wants Fascism. order. Yeah, yeah, right wing wants law enforcement. Right wing wants institutions. Right wing trusts the systems and, and tradition. Uh -huh. Seeing what the CIA did to Trump, uh, specifically, they framed him. For for this whole Russia, the whole Mueller, the first thing, just totally that was one hundred percent fabricated. And, and some people think that it wasn't. And they're like, well, what about these thirteen indictments? Those were all for obstruction of justice because you caught people in lies about other things when Gosh. you. When, so like every and 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 they people are just either stupid or acting in bad faith. So that's why I've, I've completely abandoned the corporate press. There's literally no one on the corporate press who's. Do you, you do you pay for cable? Uh, we do we do YouTube TV uh, on the off sporting events, and yep. Uh, Jill, yep. Jillian likes to watch Bravo. So yeah. she needs to know what's up. Kay was but, on the Vanderpump last uh, night. Oh yeah, yeah. Last night couldn't miss it. Yeah, man. Episode three. So so, but um, but yeah, I think what's different is you know people like my parents, for example, like institutionalists to the core, to the core, right? Um, you know. They they've completely changed. They're like, I don't trust the FBI. I don't trust the CIA. Our, our military is an extension of that. We need to bring the troops home. I mean, every, everybody goes. You know, there's some like hardcore libertarians who are like, the troops are complicit. No, no, no. like you need to bring that. They yeah. they believe that they're actively helping, and yeah. and they don't know that like there's they're no, literally th signing up to no die. Like, truly, P potentially, like, yeah. Like, like that's. Not made lightly. But you don't want to be told that you're yeah. fighting for nothing. Like yes. people that will, that's upsetting to people. So conservatives, I think, have gone through this period of ontological shock. You know what that is? That's a, that's a term that I, I like to use to describe what I experienced that sort of changed me. Which, so in The Matrix, when, uh, when Keanu Reeves uh, unplugs and he looks around and he sees that everybody else is plugged in, he's like, mm -hmm. that's when he has the realization of like, whoa. Reality was not what I thought it was. Mm -hmm. It's the realization that the reality you live in is fundamentally different from what you expect, from what you believed it to be. And it's just a shift. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So a lot of, I, you're not going to get them back now. They're outsiders. So they don't trust the system at all. So I could see back to RFK Jr. If there's any mechanism for him to win, he's going to pick up a lot of Republicans, a lot of Repu like a material amount of Republicans. But there, but this is why when I say it's rigged, the elections are rigged. Uh, it's it's just Republicans and Democrats, mm -hmm. and if they can successfully uh, box you out of the primary by many times using corrupt party party mechanisms yeah. to do that, fully corrupt, basically, then, then they can prevent people from having a choice to yeah. to vote for you, gerrymandering the media, yeah, if you will. Yeah, that plus all the money in politics. And then I have like the, this is a left-wing view, by the way, apparently, uh, that, uh, you know, Citizens United was crazy. It's crazy that you can have dark money organizations that can put unlimited money in and there's no accountability. Mm -hmm. I think people should be able to put money in, but you should, you should be able to trace it. It should be just like this that Robin Williams movie where he's the president. I think, it's, I think it's called Man of the People. Yeah. And he makes a joke about this. Man of the Year. Man of the Year. Yeah, yeah. He makes a joke about this, but it's, this is what I think the campaign finance law should be. 
every uh per, like politician should have like a, like race car drivers like a patch of all their sponsors i love that but you should have like there should be a little man you want to mandate disclosures mandate a little pie chart that shows like what and there should be like little like a uh, little icons at the bottom of all their ads it's like this this uh, politician is sponsored by these industries mm-hmm. you know you know and if it's like well you're sponsored by banks right. and you want them to have like way higher interest rates no it seems like they're just paying you to say that what do you think about banking stuff right now and and financial markets right now are you uh, at being not anti you're not anti-establishment i don't think i think you're not i want to live and have money i'm just cheering for the demise of of uh people who are evil yes yeah <laughs> uh, evil evil in the way that is uh holding everyone else back for their own I just think benefit. I think the corporate press does not tell the truth about things uh, when it comes to foreign policy. Is it worth it? <laughs> do, do, do people deserve the truth? And this is, mm. I mean, like, so like even right now with like the alien stuff, like if somebody comes to me and like my buddy yesterday tells me like, hey, this is some crazy, I'm going to tell you some crazy shit that I just heard. And they're pretty high up in the chain of of command of things that trickle down. That to me doesn't feel like an accident Mm -hmm. and it all it feels planted it feels like of course you're going to tell this person that has the outlets to reach everybody and then it comes to me i don't give a shit Mm -hmm. there's no outside information that's coming to me that's going to tell me that spaceships exist like i don't care i'm telling you jets ain't shit if you are impressed by jets you do not live in the same reality that i live in that's Mm -hmm. all there is to it these jets ain't shit they're nothing none of them and if that's if you're impressed by these things, then we do live in separate realities. And we're talking about banking right now and uh, banking crises of people are putting hundreds of millions of dollars into a bank account that only insured up to 250000 They des- In my book, and I hate to say this, I'm sorry, like, I'm sorry if this offends anyone, but anyone who does that is a fucking idiot and deserves to be taken advantage of. Yeah. It You you are going to lose your money because you are being lazy and thoughtless and careless. And there's no other terms that you can put on it that aren't lazy, thoughtless, and careless. You're, you're not thinking ahead. You're not playing chess. You're not um, taking in the rules that they told you. They explain that it's literally posted on the fucking door as you walk in right. on every it bank. Is, yeah. And you are just ignoring it of like, oh, we'll just put more money in there, more money in there, more money in there. Because well, you think nothing bad's ever going to happen. You, you have a yeah, positivity but, bias. Well, it's it's easier to, well, you know, nothing bad like this has ever happened in most people's lifetime in terms of a liquidity crisis where they're going to lose all their money. But like it's always been Valley. this way. They just have, hasn't been apparent. The one, two percent of deposits is available. Well, that that was a uniquely see, the thing about that. As you, I'm sure you know, that that bank is not a normal banking situation. Right, right, right. Um, but what it, what it's doing, and I know because my sister works at a, a regional bank. Any any bank that's not um, uh, like a large institutional bank, like one of the five biggest banks, they're seeing huge departures. Especially if, like my sister's bank, they have a lot of institutional money, so it's like people that have like you know 100 million dollars in the account and that and like they realize oh i might like the cost of insuring this yeah it's like well i guess i can just go to chase where i'm not worried about that you know what i mean so so they're seeing money flee and the problem with that is that's that makes it harder to get loans too because you know you can get an sba loan it takes a long time but it's it's basically when it comes to the big uh the big banks you only, my experience has been that you can really only get money dollar for dollar for what you already have. Mm-hmm. So like, so when we wanted to buy the first DPDO restaurant, uh, we had to get an SBA, SBA loan. And, you know, we, uh, we put down like 20% and 80% we had to pay over seven years. And, uh, but my parents had to put their house up for that. They weren't like, oh, cool. Here's a business plan. They're like, we got you. We got your balls. Uh-huh. What are you gonna do? Uh-huh. I hope we don't have to take them. <laughs> I hope we don't have to take your house. Yeah, yeah. So you know that that wasn't like a real loan. Whereas with smaller banks, um, it, it's been uh, it's been really easy to be honest with you. Like, to, not easy. Like, you you have to. What you here's what I learned. So let me give you a little business move here, man. Please. 
If you're ever trying to do a business acquisition, you want to buy a business or you want to buy a piece of cash flowing property, what you need to do is you need to get your money right. So get your investors right first before you go even look for anything. Okay. Because these things move so fast. You have to have everything ready. So get your investors ready. And then you have two or three bankers that you're talking to at the same time that are in the deal with you. You start talking to them, hey, I'm doing this deal for this thing. For me, it's campgrounds. Hey, I'm looking to get my second campground. I'm going to have two, maybe three bankers in the deal. And I tell them, like, look, you're my guy. But I'm talking to somebody else. You understand due diligence. So we'll see who has the best offer. And then by that time, you have three offers, two or three offers from different banks that are ready to go. They already have all the approvals. When, as soon as you're ready to go make your deal, you know, you see who you're going to go with. And, um, it's, that's a lot. That seems to be like there are more loans coming out of these smaller institutions because they have to do that. It's how they're staying a lot. Like yeah, that's they like, literally need that income. And and so now that we are taking a lot of money, what's happening as a result of this is a lot of just less money for them to loan out. So, mm-hmm. and the interest rates, you know, the banking environment generally, I'm kind of waiting it out. That's how uh, I am. Too I mean, right I now. I really want to. Uh, I mean, a close friend of mine uh, just bought a uh, a house recently. To two friends of mine, but one of them just bought just very recently bought a house. And he's just getting, he's paying crazy high interest, mm-hmm. hoping he's going to refinance later. Mm-hmm. But, um, uh, yeah, definitely feeling good that I, I locked in at like 2.7%. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen, was, baby. So tell me look. more about DP Doe. It's so interesting to me that you like, you had this huge corporate experience of went in small, yeah. took over. Well, regionally, we, 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 so we came in, there was 24 and we, mm-hmm. we went on our, our tour across the country. Just each, uh, and that was nonstop. We, everyone mapped it out. 24 of them. Yeah. Uh, well, we, we did like three, maybe three trips, uh-huh. but cause DBDO is in New York, Maryland, Delaware, West Virginia, Ohio, Illinois, and then a lot of them in Colorado. I spent a lot of time in Colorado, which is great. I love Colorado. Yeah, I haven't been in a while, but yeah, man, it's, it was I used to go there twice a year. But but anyway, um, yeah, we just went to visit them all, and uh, we ended up shutting down seven of them because we either couldn't reach an agreement with them, or <laughs> see every everybody. A lot of these stores had stopped paying royalties, so they owe, they owed the old guy back royalties. So we used that as leverage to come in to have them sign the new agreement, which was like a big boy, like. 40 page franchise agreement mm-hmm. as opposed to a three page like napkin. And there's deal. no choice. Like you're signing this or you're signing this or you stop using the brand. DP and you're lucky yeah. that I'm not going to take all your stuff and sue you. I don't have time. I have yeah. things to do. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's like we had $100,000 people owed. It was like, I'll waive the 100K and you can sign. And then if they don't want to do it, we usually just make them sign something else that says, you know, they're going to take it down and make them pull the stuff down. Mm-hmm. But, um, but anyway, we only had to do that for maybe. Well, it ended up being seven, but uh, so now you're down to eight, seventeen. Seventeen. Yeah. So then we then we built all these systems. Just like we built, you know, we built training, we built an intranet, we had built an operating manual. How do you make a calzone? There was nothing in writing. There was no franchise. We had to build everything from scratch. And then we had to make protocols for franchisees to make requests. Franchisees need things, you know. So then we had to, I had to, be, you know, build the positions. And this is where I got into doing the traction, yeah. business planning, Crushed stuff that with of that all. Shit, yeah. But, uh, but, but yeah, then we we sold it at so so doing the traction planning, which I'll come back to here in a second because it's, it's awesome. Um, as a result of that, uh, was basically it, it, it's this method of finding what's the most important thing you should be doing in your business. And we got to the point where we had, we had 27 and we had a competitor that had 16, but three years before they had three and two years before they had eight. And then they just kept growing and growing. And I'm like, dude, and, and, and they had been going to different markets than we were in. Um, but, but what happened is a couple of times they were opening a new store and we were opening a new store and we didn't know about each other and we would open at the same time mm-hmm. and they were a direct knockoff of what we were doing, but like legally, you can knock off someone's, you can open a stainless steel, uh, Mexican restaurant that serves burritos and the exact same ingredients and the exact same order as Chipotle. If you don't use any of the same trademarks, you can mm-hmm. do literally everything exactly the same. Um, you just can't use any of the protected marks. So, so anyway, uh, that's what the, those guys were doing. And I reached out to them. I was like, Hey, 
can you, you know, you want to, I basically, the most important thing in the company was for me to reach out to them and just try, like, can, you know, can you, you change your name and we'll waive, you know, your stores don't have to pay a royalty for 15 years or whatever, and we'll pay you something. And, you know, mm -hmm. just to try to get everybody under the same umbrella. And then he goes, oh, well, what's your number? Why don't I just buy you out? And I go, okay, hold on, buddy. I'm just hanging out. <laughs> <laughs> I really want it, you know. Uh -huh. uh, but my 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 parents had just uh, retired the year before, and uh, you know, I was just kind of like, how many years into this? This is were six you? years in. So six years in, you, and you're, Me and you're my six mom, years my dad in on the loan. Yeah. You're, you're paying the loan off. The house is uh, looking on, better on the Athens location. Yeah, right, and right. Then, and then the uh, we were able to get a seller. The loan for the house is crazy. That's a ballsy yeah. move. Yeah, dude. Oh, I know a guy. Uh, I know a guy in, in in Nashville who's a real estate mogul now, mm -hmm. who who went down there to be a musician, and uh, he worked at a wine a wine shop. Um, convinced his in in Tennessee, you can only own one liquor permit per person, uh, and so uh, basically. His owner of his wine and liquor. Oh, also, you had to buy wine at the wine shop. You can't. It wasn't for sale in grocery stores. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, basically, his guy wanted to open a bigger one somewhere else, so he's going to sell it to to my friend. And but my friend didn't have any money, so he got his parents to give him like a hundred grand from a, a HELOC on their house, so wow. he could put down as a deposit. And the owner financed another like nine hundred grand, financed ninety percent of it. My dude uh, uh, buys it from uh, buys it from this guy, grows it, doubles the sales of it, pays off his loan, and then finds out that the state of Tennessee is about to uh, change the liquor laws such that wine could be for for sale in grocery stores, and he sells it, walks away with a big chunk of money, oh gives his parents gosh. his money back, and then all the people he he was in uh, Green Hills, which is like where a lot of the like you know money people money, live, yeah, and yeah. So he he used some of his money contacts that would come in and just buy like fifty thousand dollars of wine. He like be friend of these real estate guys. I was like, let me put some money in with you on a deal. Show me how to do it. And now he's got you know he's, he's worth probably thirty or forty million. Wow. He's just a monster. Wow. And he did it all. He he is the American dream. Total bootstrap. So Incredible. when I when I hear people who are like man 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 I'm like mm -hmm. well meritocracy is a lie. Mm -hmm. It's not exactly fair. But it's doable if you just if like if you're special. If you're special, you can make it go. I don't even think about. I think all the time. I think to myself like I'm not worried. I'm never worried about employment or income. And I'm like I just think to myself like if I wanted to take over anything, I would just go do it. It's not even a question of like how like most people's thing in their head is like timing. I've given up on time because I've seen success over time, and I've learned that expectation lesson. Now it's just like, just go clean the fucking toilet. Yeah. I know that I would just clean the toilets the best every day. And once the toilets were so clean, it'd be like, hey, why don't you clean this area? I'd be like, okay. Why don't you clean this area? Okay. Next thing, be like, why don't you look at our finances? Okay. <laughs> why don't you look at the man? Why don't you look at our scheduling system? Okay. Yeah. And then before you know, I'm be running this bitch. And it's going to be because I keep my things in order and I show up and I'm consistent and you can, you don't have to, you don't have to manage me. I will manage myself. Once you manage yourself, it's game fucking over. You no longer have a manager anymore. True. And like, unless yeah. they're micromanaging you. I, I, but, I could never go back to um, working, I think, at a company. I mean, some, I've thought about it, mm -hmm. uh, you know, from time to time, but I, it's once you have complete freedom, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's hard to, to go back. And when, you know, complete freedom, the problem is you don't really, you're, you're, you have to do the things that you have to do to make all the things go that you're yes. doing. But I get to choose what I'm doing. Yeah. And I'm prioritizing what's what, you know? So I've, I have very random days. Some days are all law. Some days are all spreadsheets and finances. Some days are me hanging up uh, arcade lights uh, and assembling uh, video games at the campground, putting Amen. together a foosball table. You're you doing know? it all. Are you... Are you going, and I know I keep wanting to ask you about, still ask you about DP Dough, because it's such interesting to me that you ended up selling yeah. it and yes. like, move on. We, we go, well, just to, on DP Dough, we, um, so we, we reached out to, uh, to the guys, uh, Eric Cook is the guy's name that bought it, and he, he's like a contractor by trade, so that's how they're able to grow so fast. He was mm -hmm. also, just go do it. He was a manager, 
he, actually, this is a good story. He was a manager at DPDO in Cortland, New York. And, uh, and he reached out to the original owner uh, and said, hey, I want, I'd like to go open my own store in Buffalo. This is like maybe 2009, 2010. And, and the guy goes up, the original founder of DPDO, DP Dan, he goes up uh, to, to see him uh, with, with some other guys. They go to Buffalo to go on this trip to look at you know, locations. And they end up going to a strip club and spending the whole day in the strip club, and they don't even Amen. go to the two market. To, there's like two places, like the college place and like the downtown bar place, and they didn't even go. They went to Buffalo and just spent the whole day yeah. just like at the stri- like Amen. strip club buffet. What kings? <laughs> so no, so so Eric was like, uh, he's like, look, I'm not. I'm. This is a joke. I'm not doing this. So then he started his own competing thing. It nice. was like a knockoff. Um, but anyway, so so he flipped his stores and that made us have like forty two DPDOs wow. right right for the sale, mm-hmm. and then uh, so we sold to him completely. My parents are out; they bought a they bought a lake house in Missouri. They're chilling; Amen. it's all From good. Fire, incredible story. <laughs> That's great. And uh, and yeah, um, you know we uh, and I bought a campground, and uh, and, and yeah, um, I'm now the general counsel for DPDO, and he's the guy that bought it, like. He's the man. How's it going like now? He's made Very, it go. going well. It's, I, he I took hear it the from name. Forty-two to sixty-two. Wow! I was gonna say I hear it. I hear people They're say it opening every now and then. Yeah. Everywhere, opening awesome. everywhere, man. So back to you. You're saying like you're jumping around, prioritizing for yourself and things. Are you prioritizing based on what you enjoy doing? Um, what's the fi- the the biggest fire at the moment, or what's most fun for you? Like, how are you really? Mm. You have a band. Your general counsel, DP Doe. You have we have a golf outing for Music Loves Ohio Saturday. That's right. um, yeah. He, this man, really doing literally everything. A, a law firm. He's in literally in a monster cover band called the Winnie Cooper Project. They are like performing at fucking stadiums and shit. <laughs> yeah, it's cool. And um, I mean, this guy's crushing it. Like, how are you prioritizing? How do you find time to do all these things as a dad of two and and a family man? I mean, you're you're present everywhere all the time. He's getting in his bag. He's getting in his bag, ladies and gentlemen. What's he pulling out? Okay. I don't I uh I thought I would have it with me. Usually I do. So I have an analog piece of paper that's my to-do list. Uh Okay. And uh I basically go through my emails. I have five email accounts Mm -hmm. that are all from the different things I do. Mm -hmm. And um I I organize it by uh, the top is like personal stuff, and then it's like my podcast, the campground. Uh, I still have another business that I'm wrapping up, uh, and then the and this law ongoing firm. list you add to it and prioritize, uh-huh. and then you're just going through checking off as you can. Yeah, yeah, and then for each respective like business entity component, that's what I do too. But I don't have six things going <laughs> like you do. Well, what what the thing the main thing is I'm following traction for each thing I do. So mm-hmm. let's talk about traction a little bit. Uh, traction is basically a one page business plan and it's a prioritization system. So when I, uh, when I had the DPDO world, people would always come up to me and be like, Hey, you got this, you got to worry about, don't you know that, you know, like, you know, they would just tell me all these crazy things and, mm-hmm. and I would be like, Oh, I got to worry about that. That's a threat. And then they'd be like, Hey, have you considered, you know, whatever it is. I remember the big thing for a while was, uh, you could blast people's phones with a Bluetooth if they came yeah, within walk, a, yeah. a certain yeah. distance of your, she's like, we would try random technologies, um, but anyway, so it's like, wow, which ones do we spend our time doing? And then you all, then you have the, the list of things you wake up every day that you know you have to do, like your must do's, like what's mm-hmm. your really your core job. And then you have fires, and everybody spends their all their time is spent on fires and their core job, and nobody ever has time to address threats or opportunities. That was mm-hmm. my experience. Mm-hmm. And um, so, what traction does is it forces you to prioritize. Um, and you, and what you do is you, you look 10 years out and you can revise it. I kind of revise mine. I have a modified traction form because 10 years is such a long, like things are changing so, so fast yeah, now. 10 years. Fine. I kind of do. I, I tend to do five years. Five is a lot too. Yeah. I mean, a couple of years ago, I was like, I can't even look five years ahead. Now yeah. I think I can't. Five's okay for me now, but a couple of years personally, ago, I, I don't, but for business, I, I, I kind of feel like I have to, but so Five, I go five years out and I go, what's the best case scenario? Like, like if everything went perfectly, what's the best case? Which is really hard to do because sometimes when it goes perfectly, you get on a whole different trajectory, but then mm-hmm. you just make a new traction plan. Sure, sure. <laughs> like, that's yeah. the reality. Yeah. But, um, but, but, um, 
so you go, if it goes perfectly, where do I want to be in five years, dream scenario, and what are those metrics? Um, and, and you have to, it has to be measurable. You have to be able to check a box. Did I do it or not? It can't be like, I want to have a super dope company. That's the best. <laughs> it, needs to, it, it needs to be like X, X amount of sales, this many widgets or, or, or a, a ranking. It needs to be something that's like verifiable that can be checked. Like a, mm-hmm. a whether or not you did it that or not. You're, yeah. You're not decide. It's just a real yeah, hard. Yeah, it's not subjective. Objective. Yeah. 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 Uh, you said objective, and I said subjective at the same time. It was cool. <laughs> <laughs> it was cool. <laughs> so, so anyway, um, uh, uh, and then you you look at your three year picture, or well, so I guess it would be like a two year picture if you're looking at a five year, uh, the one this far out. So you go in two years, what needs to be true for me to be on track to hit that five year? Okay, so for that you're going to list out numbers too, you know. But you're also going to uh, going to put bullet points. Well, I'll need to have an office. I'll need to have you know a salesperson or whatever. I'll need to have this, this, and this. This is what the world looks like in my mind when everything's perfect. I'll need to have this. I'll need to have that. This, this, this. I mean, to be able to have that level, what I want in five years, I'm going to need to have these things. That, you know, I'm going to need a distribution hub. I'm going to need like you just think of like, wow, what's what has to be true for that for the big thing you want, and then you go, okay, you go you get to your, to your one year, and you go, all right, what what um, I'm sorry. Before you do your one year, you go through your issues. So the issues are just your problems, your threats, your opportunities. What's all the shit? What are all the things? And you rank the things that you need to spend time on among your issues. And so that's uh, – it's systems really devel- designed for like two to 200 people, right? But the leadership team votes – and does weighted votes on what the issues are. Mm-hmm. So that's how you get like the, and then everybody gets behind it because they feel like they contributed to, to the rankings. Right. Mm-hmm. So you rank all their the, plan. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You rank all, it's like very democratic. You just have to really think about who you give votes to. Right. Sure. <laughs> but, uh, <Always>. anyways, <laughs> but, uh, but, but anyway, so, um, uh, you get the issues ranking and then for your one year you go, all right, Given that these issues are the top issues in the company and I need to be here in two years, what do I need to do in the next one year? What what are the five or six things I need to get done in the next one year to address my issues and to be on track for the two-year goal? And then you get to your rocks, which is my your 90-day projects, because you have quarterly meetings to you change it every quarter. So you go, what are my nine, what are my five big projects? And you have to do those because it's like the stupid thing of the big jar and you got the big rock and the sand and the pebbles and the water. Mm -hmm. And depending on what order you put them in, it fits or it doesn't fit. It only works if you put the big ass rock in first and then the little ones on top of it and then you put the water in last or whatever. And so the point is you fucking have to get this rock done. It is your main job. If you don't get the rock done, you're fired. That's how it was in DPDO. Mm-hmm. You have to get the we- so old lady quit the work for us because she wasn't going to get a rock done. I'm like, you have two weeks before the meeting, before your deadline. I'm like, we will do whatever it takes to work with you, you're telling us two weeks out that you're not going to get it done. Let's get it done. Let's get you over the goal line. We'll work with you. She's yeah. like, I just, I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm like, okay, bye. <laughs> like she didn't even want to do it See, then. Because that's the she thing. She just didn't want to be held responsible. You have meetings every week. And every week you ask each, you go through the rocks. Every week you're basically holding the dog's nose to the shit, right? Mm-hmm. You go through the rocks. Sometimes you're the dog, right? You go through the rocks and you're like, are you on track? And then they either say yes or they say no and I need help. And they bring it up and then everybody helps them to get their shit. They have to get it done or they're fired Mm -hmm. unless it was approved and agreed that it's not going to be met by the timeline and you punt it. So like that's the main thing with the system. Fired. You cannot work with us if you don't take this seriously. I love this. But you're going to be given every opportunity. And if you see it coming down the road, we're going to speak up. Yeah, Yeah. we're going to all work with you. And if it's reasonably not possible, then then we're going to punt it. it. Yeah. If it's reasonably not possible. Exactly. But once you get two punts, you're gone. <laughs> That's not. I love this system. So, so yeah, this so, is and this. I think you told me about this before. This is an actual like sold system. Like this is a yeah. business EOS thing. entrepreneurial uh, entrepreneurial operating system. The book's called the book is called Traction. And uh, but but anyway, um, so yeah, that, that's how I make all my decisions about what to do and and um, you know once we, once we sold DP though, I'm still involved as general counsel, but uh, you know I wanted something that was gonna. 
be a good investment. Uh, and uh, the campground, you know, cash flowing real estate seemed good. Mm-hmm. And it's been awesome. I always wanted to be a politician too before I found everything was still fake. a young man. Still a young man. <laughs> well, plenty of time. Well, I never, ever, ever will do politics, ever. That's what he says. But uh, he recorded. Buying the campground basically is like buying a mayorship. Sure. So it makes me know that I don't like. I'm a local celebrity. Everybody <laughs> wants to. T- everybody wants, wants to, to know tell the owner. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. they want to tell me what's broken. Sure, of course <laughs> they do. Of course they do. Uh-huh. Uh huh. But but yeah, no. I mean, it's uh. So I say that to, like I I've always said I want you can be careful what you wish for, and then I kind of got it. So like, okay, yes. But uh, but it's you know it's 45 acres, man, and uh, like 30 acres of. Um, RV sites up top and just the infrastructure, all the stuff. And we have 216 full hookup sites that are seasonal. Those are all sold out with a 50 person paid waiting list. Wow. And then we have 16 sites that are like uh, short term that we sell out on the week, we sell on the weekends. And then uh, we have another 18 sites in our primitive area, which is like 15 acres along the river, along the Olentangy River. And we have a pavilion down there, a disc golf course. We do live music every Saturday night, kids activities every Saturday. What's this called? If you want to give it a shout out, here? Riverbend Family Campground. Okay. Yeah, man, it's a, yeah. It, yeah. Come come visit us. Seasonal, you're gonna have to wait years. To be honest with you, that's amazing. But, uh, congratulations yeah, no, on that's fantastic. So like, it wasn't like that year one. You didn't have when you took over. Was there already a waiting list? And now you're making improvements, and that's just growing, growing, growing. There wasn't How? a paid waiting list. Uh-huh. There was a loose. We were sold out when we when we came in. Mm-hmm. And there was uh, there was like maybe fifteen people, but no one had talked to them. And my idea was, we're making pay ten dollars a year to be on this waiting list and renew, and then we can know how many hot leads we have. Mm-hmm. If you're willing to go through this process every year to go pay ten dollars, you care enough to keep doing this. Yeah. And you know, so because we just don't want because you want to be chasing them down at the end of the day. Well, it's that, an insurance yeah. policy. We know exactly how you know how many yeah. people are interested. If if people you know for like damn, we're gonna have twenty people leave. It's like yeah, we got fifty coming in. Yeah. So we've covered DP Doe. We've got the loose. We've got the loose campground. Tell us about Music Loves Ohio. Yeah, man. Music Loves Ohio uh, started that in t- 2010, and it is a, uh, a five- after he was after he was fired. He fired it up. After I was fired, he, after he was fired, he fired it up. A uh, five hundred. It's a five hundred one c three nonprofit that uh, helps Central Ohio is where we focus right now. Uh, Central Ohio kids. Uh, pursue their passion for music through mm. writing, recording, and performing. So specifically what we do is we give grants to organizations uh, like after-school programs, sometimes mm-hmm. schools, and those are in $500 I have blocks. some equipment I would donate cool. to that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, sometimes it's equipment. Uh, sometimes it's, you know, a lot of times that is what schools buy. We, we tend to buy a lot of ukulele sets sure. for elementary Easy. schools. Yeah. We've done maybe 10 of those. Nice. Um, and then we do, uh, so, you know, that's kind of like the, for elementary schools and after school programs. And then for elite musicians, we do, uh, two, two, two things for them. One is, um, uh, instrument grants. So if they have access to music education and they're really good and this like really passionate about it and they have someone that'll vouch for them. We give them instrument grants, so we'll buy an instrument, or we'll pay like you know, we got somebody that's about to get a trumpet. They have their trumpet stolen, and they're like incredible. And uh, we're gonna like, get you a trumpet. Uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're gonna put like five hundred bucks towards it, and they're gonna. How put, much is a trumpet? They got one for like twelve hundred bucks. They can get, nice. but, so they're still gonna pay a lot of money. But, that's used trumpet, right? Exactly. What's a new one? What's a uh, maybe like twenty nine hundred bucks, Damn. something like that? Yeah. Damn. So, uh, so. And then the other thing we do, this is probably the biggest thing that's the most impactful, is that we give college scholarships to uh, summer performance camps, okay? Not to college itself, but we basically give these low-income kids that are elite uh, that can qualify uh, for these, uh, that basically would get a scholarship if only they had a chance to audition. Mm -hmm. But the audition itself is at these summer performance camps, which costs like $1,000 to go to. Mm -hmm. So every year we send two or three kids to the Berkeley five week performance camp at Amazing. Berkeley College of Music, mm-hmm. and uh, we we've, we've sent twenty kids there. It's thirty five hundred dollars. Wow. So we usually only pay like half of it, but still, it's I mean we've materially Amazing. contributed. Amazing. And um, 
of the You're about, awesome. Of the about twenty, thanks, man. Of the about twenty kids we sent, we've had uh, six of them get full ride scholarships. My king, that is amazing. The first guy we sent is this like killer jazz pianist in Barcelona. Amazing, no, it's amazing. And he is he from here locally? He's from Columbus, yeah. He's and, from. Uh, he went to Afrocentric. And then and then you just he's out in the world right now, just, just crushing. crushing it. Yeah. Wow. The degree from Berkeley that's paid for. Wow, my king, that is incredible. Uh, we have a golf outing at yep. Safari right. this Saturday. What are you doing for raising funds there? Just taking <clears throat> donations and entry fees and yeah, whatever else? Yeah, entry fees. We have a, a beat the... Uh, <laughs> uh, a, a beat the pro thing they bring it but it's like this lpga pros and sure. they're like you know they come in and it's all the guys are like oh, i can beat that chick no and they she like works them she's gonna work them. yeah so that's, <laughs> <laughs> I, I i i know like if you're if it's a f- girl that plays golf and she plays like and she like has all the golf she stuff, plays yeah like she play there's, there's a lot of guys that that play golf and don't they have all that, the stuff that don't really play good. golf yeah they have everything though if the girls play have the stuff they typically are yeah, uh, they have a minimum level of, of talent. I've been learning a lot about golf the last two years and the level of golf that it takes to play. We played uh, my godson's family there at Springfield Country Club, which uh-huh. is uh, the guy who built, I don't know if you know this, but a lot of the courses around here are built by like the best golf course builders in the world. Robert Trent Jones, didn't uh, he do like... Uh, so many. Yeah. I, I, the, die, the Doss family, Die family, they've, uh, they've done a lot. I don't remember all the people's names, but there's uh, quite a few around here that are very prolific golf course builds. Built, yeah. Lots of people from small town Ohio have built the major golf courses that people recognize globally. And a lot of them are right here. But we're down there playing in Springfield, and like it's a U.S. Open qualifier course. It ain't no fucking Columbus Municipal course. I mean, tiny it is fairways. tiny fairways, thick, rough, incredibly hard tee placement, uh, pin placement. You know, it's like it's very very tough and you start thinking like oh i could golf it looks pretty fucking yeah. easy and you get out there and it's like whoo i golfed a, a hundred you know you golf in a hundred and you feel like you did decent and it's like yeah if, if you shot a 72 or under you're fucking talking about going to the u.s open you're not talking right. about like right. you're just gonna be good with your buddies like uh, that's Far, far away. It's like yeah. no bad shots, no bad holes type energy. The thing about golf is it just depends on how much you play. Yes. Uh, it's just yes. so uh, dependent on that. Like, I, I use that's everything. There, that's definitely true. I mean, I played a fair amount growing up, but like, I, there's one yeah. summer where I lived in Jefferson City, Missouri, and it was my first year, my year between law school and, uh, and, uh, my first year of law school and my second year of law school. And I and I had a job working backstage at the amphitheater on the weekends. Mm-hmm. So I would go like like be a runner, like a production assistant for like whatever cool, cool band was playing. Um, but but anyway, uh, I played golf three times a week. Me wow. and the other intern, mm-hmm. and it was you know a ten week. Per- I mean, so I, I probably played golf yeah easily twenty five thirty times. That's crazy. That's a lot more than I played in like years combined. I see. Yeah, it was crazy. And then and then, to, and then I went maybe like seven years. I played once a year. Mm-hmm. And that's why I love scrambles. I played. This will be my third time when we play Saturday. So mm-hmm. third scramble this year. No, my third just time out. Oh, okay. I like to play nine, which is a contrarian thing to do. People yeah, I don't are, fuck with nine. I, yesterday we went and he was like, "I think you're only gonna be able to get nine in." I was like, "Then I'm not golfing. I need to know now." It's, it's hard for me <laughs> to. It, it's I'm hard. just getting warmed up at nine. That's true, and I did feel that way this last time I played nine. The first time I played nine, I didn't feel that way, but but um, I the. It's just hard for me to justify. I can play a lot more golf if I only play nine. Yeah, it is. I, I mean, can't do a five hour block. I did five hours yesterday, and it was because there was people in front of us. Usually, if it's me and another person, we can get done in three and a half if we're not too held up. But yeah. so this is an interesting thing that I, I fun to bring up to you, an Ohio guy. Um, we went to Bentry, uh, North Delaware ish area, a few weeks ago. It was fucking slapping at noon on a Wednesday. Oh yeah. Group in front of us, group behind us waiting, and we're waiting. So it's literally nonstop waiting. You know, it's just like, well, wait on them to drive, and then we'll hit, and then we'll drive up. And like, you might get two segments of two shots for two or four people where you get to smoothly play without a hiccup of waiting. I'm standing there at the tee box, getting ready to tee off on like the 14th hole. People are behind us waiting. Like, they finished quickly. We've been waiting for five minutes. You know, we're having a drink of our beer and talking and hanging out. Columbus is just beginning to grow. And 
golf courses on Wednesday afternoons right. are already completely sold out, no times available. I played on Tuesday, it was sold out. Yeah. Aim, yesterday was bat, bumper yeah. to bumper at we, our tea time was one thirty. It was nonstop whole way through, and then it was a league early and a league in the evening, and then some just regular guys coming in like us to get in in the middle of those. So we're fitting in where we get in where we fit in. We actually didn't get to play eighteenth hole because a new league was teeing off. So instead of playing eighteen, we played nine, which was empty, mm-hmm. and played nine for a second time to end our round. What the fuck is Ohio gonna do in the next five years? Got when all those it, chips. Are we are kind of we gonna things. are we gonna see an explosion of golf courses and uh, other recreational things like like campgrounds and uh, water parks and things like that grow? Are we gonna see more? I just don't know how we're going to sustain or entertain this. We have Intel coming in. They're talking. I don't. I don't even want to start saying numbers because I've heard so many different things. But I mean. Thousands of jobs, and then those thousands of jobs is just the tip of the iceberg because each one of those positions I've heard is like seven or eight jobs beneath them that is in the supply chain oh. that will be filtered into that. That so every so every one is actually eight yeah. hires. That's you know we're talking fifty thousand, a hundred thousand new people, and then you talk about their families coming in with money, with money, yes, yeah. people that are professionals and. Right. And, and very high skill set individuals. What the fuck are we going to do? Like, I just imagine all Alum Creek packed, jam packed, where you can't even get out. Like, it's going to be like, you're going to have to have a boat slip and a permit to get on the water, and they're going to be limited. Right. And like, is that the future we're headed towards? Like, with a billion people in America, are we like, hey, you can't even take your boat out unless you get a boat slip this year, and it's going to be like hunting where you have to win the lottery to get the ticket to get the animal i think they'll build they'll build more stuff there's a lot there's a lot of place there's a lot of room to grow as somebody just i drive to near marion ohio about twice a week to go to the campground mm-hmm. and uh there's a lot of open space so you know uh but i i think if you're gonna own land columbus ohio is a, a great place to have it because the the things that i worry about are things that would affect everyone that no business could hide from like you know, I would say okay if I'm going to personally guarantee a a mortgage, a million dollar mortgage with a business, a campground, for example. Like I can't lose my house, mm-hmm. so how do I make sure I can always pay that? Well, I need the business to do well. The business needs to be cash flowing clearly well enough. Well, what if something catastrophic happens, and all of a sudden that business goes away? There's something like you know what I mean. Like mm-hmm. that's what I worry about. But I I, re- I try not to worry too much because I realize that. If those things have the horrible things happen, everyone's fucked. Everyone's fucked. That's, yeah. that's like a torn, yep. That's like a Don't hurricane. Think about that. Nothing you yeah. can do there. Solar flare, like the internet goes out. <laughs> yeah. Like every, who gives a shit? There's way yeah. bigger. Pro- Everybody's gotta, got way bigger problems. You gotta make make yeah. hay while the sun's shining. I think yes. is, is what they say. But um, yeah, man. Um, I know you're on a time restraint. What time we got here? You want to check your good. phone? We haven't even. Let's looked. talk about the Winnie Cooper project a little. Yeah, bit. let's do it. That's I love. Uh, I love the Winnie Cooper project. <laughs> it is so. So Matt, I learned to play piano uh, several years ago. Taught myself completely. Never, never. I knew a little bit of music theory, but I had never really even uh, set out with the idea of I'm going to learn to do this. Would you like more ice? I'm good, man. I'm okay. Good. Um, I could probably make the. I could probably call the intercom and have have no, Queen no, bring no, us down no, ice. No, no, no. no. Um, and. Uh, this guy comes to where I'm out in Huntington Beach at the time. Crump comes out to Southern California for a visit, hits me. He's like, Hey, you want to hang out for a little bit? I'm like, Yeah. He comes over. I got my piano and everything on my keyboard out. And I'm showing him, I'm like, Yeah, I'm learning this song. This motherfucker plays the song that I'm learning. Like, he's like, Let me just hear it for a second and just plays it instantaneously. And I was so sick. I was like, This fucking guy. <laughs> I've like, I spent a week learning this song. Here comes Matt. And he's like, Yeah, this is, you don't just hear it. Like, yeah, that's a C, not this C, that C, this C. Boom, boom, boom. And then he plays it. And then, like, in like, I'm not kidding you, 45 seconds to a minute, he's like fingered out the the chords to the song and he's playing like, I think it was like Rocket Man or something. And I was so blown away. And, I didn't really understand that you had such a musical inclination. And so do your friends. You have a fucking band, their tour. They're an incredible cover band. They do 90s hip hop. Yeah. Tell us about the Whitney Cooper Project and what's coming up for you this yeah. summer. Thanks, man. Yeah, we, uh, we started out, uh, Alex Hasty and I, Alex is an attorney that I 
when I got laid off uh, from my first gig and went and started my own, they him, he and his brother had office space and and uh, let me use some of their office space and sent me some work. Eventually, Alex and I became pretty good friends and uh, started playing. It was like a comedy band at first. It was during the era of like Flight of the Concords. So we would just, we were, you know, the whole thing where like, it was like white guys would play like, like, serious hip-hop music yeah. but like over in a guitar and it was like funny to hear it was all over around, it was around the same time ben, ben Foles did a record uh yeah. did uh, bitches uh, another, and shit there was a big band that was try- like uh, uh, there was a cover band around here that was like i forget their name but they were like at the barn in dublin like uh-huh. doing the, exactly that like yeah. hardcore raps but it was yeah. like a band doing it yeah so so um we we started playing a little bit, you know, just like a, a local bar, Woodlands Tavern, just to meet the two of us acoustic. This is in 2010. And then more and more people, a friend of ours played guitar and, and he, he sat in and he was better than us. And then, you know, a drummer joined the band and then this girl that played keys joined the band. We just kept adding people. This, this girl who's like a, a ringer, a lead vocalist, <laughs> joined the band. We added our lead singer like seven years late. You know? <laughs> But uh, but <laughs> leads for seven years, and then we and then and then our husband is this incredible <laughs> guitar player. So now we have two lead guitarists, and then like one of the best saxophone players there is, uh, Terrence Farmer uh, plays plays saxophone with us. So we we added all ringers, and uh, we just have a great repertoire. So like we only play '90s rap uh, and hip hop, but we we try to do a lot of mashups. So I think the mashups is what gets people. So like we do. Um, uh, Careless Whisper, the George Michael song, mm-hmm. and with the saxophone, it's great because it's like this the the saxophone song, right? Um, and then, but we do the verses for it are Fresh Prince of Bel Air. Wow, we do love the when then we of course these days we also always make some sort of reference about emitting Chris Rock, um, <laughs> and then and then uh, never gets old, and then we do like. Uh, Tom Petty, Don't Do Me Like That is the underlying music. That and song. that's the chorus we sing. But the verses are, um, uh, 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 shit, what is that song? This is the jam for all the fellas. Try to do what the ladies tell us. Not the, not the, cause you're overzealous. How do these ideas come up? Like, where is this? Like, is this like a thing that just happens while you're jamming and you're like, Marijuana. let's do it? <laughs> cannabis. Okay. It's cannabis influence usually. <laughs> all right. Yeah. So the, the first thing we did that was different, we wrote a song called Mo- Wrote. We wrote a song called, uh-huh. uh, oh, that's the other thing. We don't play the chords. A lot of cover bands are like, oh, what are the bands playing? Let's recreate that. We just go, nah, heard enough. Like while we're writing the parts, while we're determining what instrumental parts we're going to play, like what are the chords of the song going to be, we don't consider what are the actual chords. Uh-huh. All we consider is what can we easily play and sing the same chorus over uh-huh. unless the chords like matter to the feeling of the song. Yes. Usually yes. it doesn't matter is what we found out. Really? Um, it's not, not with every song. The, the things we've added more recently uh, are kind of like on the nose. But, um, but what, else, what else do we... Oh, Motown Billy. So it's uh, <laughs> Alex and I. This is in my early days of uh, so boys to men and Michael Jackson. Is that what we're doing? Experimenting with the cannabis. Um, we were playing. He's like, oh, "Let me show you this. This uh, it's like a little minor. It's like a rockabilly version of Motown Billy." So I'm like, so we were playing it, and I'm like, "Wait, before we get to the breakdown part, before we get to that boom, 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 da, it's like the big part of the song." I'm like, "Hold on, we should tease that." With the spoken word part from David Allen Coe's "You Never Call Me by My Name," <laughs> because it's like super uh-huh. built. So, so, uh, so it's like this guitar solo into you know. And we've been singing you know Motown Philly the whole time, and then I come in. And I'm like, you know, a good friend of mine named Steve Goodman wrote that song, and he told me it was the perfect country and western song. I told him it wasn't because he hadn't said a thing at all about trains or trucks or mama or prison or getting drunk. <laughs> Anyway, so then I, so it's like so it's like then he wrote me back another letter and in that letter he put the perfect country and western song and it goes a little something like this and then like seven person wall of sound a boom 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 da it's just like sound, <laughs> and you're like amazing. what the hell that's and awesome. then we just and then we have double lead guitar a shred over that uh-huh. with a saxophone coming on top that's of it that's sick. Just, When's your next gig? We're gonna do a live record in December. Are you? Yeah. Amen. But we play a uh, nice gig. We play all covers and uh, some uh, all original covers. like that. Though we'll like, never play originals. The problem see, I'm, I do music law too. As I, you c- know, I consider and, that original. I mean, that's fun. That's a mashup. That's w- there's not a way to release that on Spotify. 
without having clearances in advance, and no one will give you a clearance unless you break the law yeah. rules. Yeah. Uh, so so creativity is about breaking. What we rules. may try to do is is mislabel it, um, mm-hmm. but I don't know if we can get past. See, like there's a compulsory. Um, just a quick side conversation. Uh, once you put a song out, you can't stop someone else from covering the song. Right. Even if you fucking hate them and you, you can't with stop a, anything. It's a purest meme there is. If I Bette mean, Midler, yeah, uh, uh, who wrote? Let's assume she wrote "When Beneath My Wings." I don't know if she. I don't know if she did or not. Okay. But if Donald Trump said, "I'm going to do a cover of Bette Midler's "When Beneath My Wings." She could not stop him, right. even if she wanted to, but he has to pay her 9.1 cents for downloads, and the streaming services have to pay her 15% of the money that's, that's made because she gets the underlying uh, copyright. The problem is nothing exists like that for the master sound recording, so for like sampling, and nothing exists for derivative works. So like if you want to take... You know, okay, you know, uh, uh, Kid Rock when you know when he did uh, all summer long over um, what Werewolves of London and uh, Sweet Home Alabama. He did that that song. He mashed those together. There's no, he can't do that. You can't change a song at all. Mm-hmm. You can maybe get away with changing a lyric here or there, doing something slightly different. Like you can present it differently. Well, then it's not mechanical, right? Yeah. So. So, um, but there needs to be a way for, I understand derivative because you don't want someone to change your thing. Now, if it's fair use, you can, which is the whole question. But like, there should be something that says like, hey, someone can use a short little sample of your song. Mm-hmm. They can use your, use your sample to make something else, but they have to give you X percent. And it's I just, don't know how this is even a conversation. Like, I don't know how we're in 2023 and this is even a conversation we're having. Like, the bottom line is, is nobody stopping anybody from being creative and releasing mm-hmm. art. Then you want to say like, okay, you can't put it on these streaming platforms that monetize things. Well, why? The goal is to have listeners. If people are listening, great. Everybody's making money. If somebody's not listening, who gives a shit? Nobody's listening. It's because the status quo benefits the people who are the, uh, the bankrollers of our elected officials. So why would they change it? They're not. They don't. They they have control right now. Right. Right. The, right. Right. The, the private equity, BlackRock and Vanguard and That's State it. Street Capital own X whatever twenty five percent of every major record label. Sure. They don't want the rules to change. They have all the leverage. They would like to keep all the leverage. And our oligarchic duopoly will maintain the status quo, man. Um, what else was I going to say? Uh, earlier I was talking about Dallas. I wanted to quickly tell you about uh, uh, my experience there, real what, quick. With the trip, yeah, the, yeah, I would love to hear. It. Yeah, don't we're not we're just talking here. We don't have any agenda. There's no agenda yeah. here. We're just Except for it. Agenda Twenty One. What's um, that? What's Agenda Twenty One? Uh, it's like the United Nations wants like everybody to like have a uh, um, digital ID with voting oh. and vaccine okay. and shit and whatever yeah, sure. social credit score. Did you get a real ID yet? No, but I have to get one. Yeah, me too. But you didn't. Did you? Put, you're putting it idea? off. No, you don't. You know, if you did, you don't. It says not for federal ID. Yeah, yeah. I have to get a pat. I'm going to the Dominican Republic in June. Okay. So, I mean January. <laughs> okay, I knew it was a J. <laughs> an, an, I thought you really meant June, and then you were you didn't want to tell people. So you're like, no, January. I, thought, I was like, you don't know where I'm going. So tell me about but, Dallas. Yeah, so, you went down there and like you did the whole walk around. It was very impressive that you did that. I really respect I, that you're doing that. I went for a conference, uh, and I went for there's actually two conferences happening at the same time. Mm-hmm. And uh, one one I refer to as the Varsity Conference, and that was like it's it's like basically. People who are in Oliver Stone's camp, people who are professors at universities, and people who actually worked on the case. Mm-hmm. Okay, so it's like very, very credible. And then the JV conference is like everybody else, mm-hmm. and that varies. <laughs> but everybody's got a book. A lot of conspiracy theorists, a lot of guys with a paper written. A lot, a lot of a lot of people who are like, it was the aliens, it okay. was the Secret Service okay. driver, it was actually Jackie. She well, was jealous. Oh yes, yeah, pow. And okay. there's always someone who goes, it was the Jews. Oh God. And then you go. Okay, they go, and then I've zoomed into why. They're like, well, the government of Israel was going to lose like some tiny amount of funding. I'm like, the government of Israel <laughs> could not have covered up the wound in the back of his head in the autopsy. What are you talking about? It's not the government of Israel, you psycho. 
<laughs> like I'm just like okay, but but there you know there's, I'm not saying it was all bad, but that was interesting. Um, but so anyway, so I came in. That was Thursday, Friday was the JV, and the varsity conference was Saturday, Sunday. So I came in Friday. I get there Friday morning. Uh, my flight leaves Columbus at like six a.m. I get there at like eight a.m. and I hit all the sites. I go to. Um, uh, the school book depository in Dealey Plaza. Then I go to General Walker's house. He's like, given uh, agenda. I had an yes, yeah, I had yeah, an agenda, yeah, and yeah, I had everything yeah. mapped out from point to point of exactly yeah. how long it was going to take me. Yes, mm-hmm. that was one thing. Taking from, notes the whole time, taking and, notes, getting as much video as I could amen. for my fire social stuff when I do it. And now I'm at the point of going back and using it. But anyway, so like my main goal for the conference was to meet some people that are kind of like in the game, right? Mm -hmm. And the most famous guy in the conspiracy world is Oliver Stone. And the second most famous guy in the conspiracy world is Oliver Stone's writer, James D. Eugenio. Mm -hmm. And anyway, so my goal, uh, I was like, man, maybe I can meet James D. Eugenio when I go down there. Wouldn't that be cool? Like maybe I can even like get his email or Almost the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. Yeah. Because I I knew he was going to be there speaking. And so the first night, Sure enough, the first Friday night of that, you I had get, to see it, ladies and gentlemen. You got to see it for it to happen. It's crazy. I get <laughs> back. You got to show up. I get back from the JV conference at the hotel, and I had just heard this guy speak, who's been in the game for a long time, or whatever. And so, so uh, I'm sitting there with these guys. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm sitting in my hotel, and I and I was like, should I go to should I go to the bar? Like, uh, you know, like it's it's uh, maybe I can meet somebody because it was kind of it was like nine thirty, and I'm by mm-hmm. myself. I'm like. Oh. You know, I'm at the hotel where the conference is. Yeah. Maybe I can find some people. Most people there are probably there for that. So we go lot. to the bar, yeah. and this particular bar was like salsa night. It was like super loud. It was definitely like, just look around. I'm like, probably not a lot of people from the conference <laughs> here. So I go back. I'm sitting in the hotel lobby, and these other guys come in and sit next to me, and they're just complaining about like you know whatever, just some, the, how hard it was to get their rental car because there was a big lacrosse tournament like in town, like a junior lacrosse tournament. And I'm like, dude, I couldn't get my. I just I joined them. I, yeah. I became friends with these people because we had a shared grievance yeah. about this bullshit lacrosse tournament taking all the rental cars. Heaven, baby. And um, and then so I started talking to them. Sure enough, it's fucking James D. Eugenio that no. I'm speaking to about you didn't this. Know shit. this? No. Oh wow. And then and then I brought up the fact that I had been at the other conference and I heard this guy. Did he introduced himself. He I'm James. No, I like, knew him right away because I looked oh. at him. I, I'm like, oh shit, because <laughs> wow. I know it. I've seen him uh-huh. many times on podcasts. Anyway, so I end up going to uh, it's him, and then the guy with him is another guy who was in. So D. Eugenio wrote the documentary, uh, the Oliver Stone's recent documentary that's like the top seller for two years in a row on Amazon, still now of DVDs. It's crazy, wow. like in its category. Two years, yeah, it's just crushed. That's insane. Um, and it's it's basically like uh, the follow up to the movie JFK with all the records released. Oh, this is a JFK out. documentary. Yeah, it's Oliver a JFK Stone. documentary. Okay, okay. It's eight hours. It's like four things. It, it came out on Showtime at first, and now it's on Amazon. Um, but, but anyway, uh, so he wrote it, it's all of his research and Oliver Stone, uh, you know, directed it. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and basically, uh, one of the guys in the movie is, is a professor in, uh, Montreal or in Quebec city. His name's Paul Blow. It's a great French name. So he's there with him. He's talking to him and I recognize him. I'm like, you're in the movie. I know you're from the movie. And then this other guy I'm talking to, this is the one I first started talking to. He's a lawyer. And he uh, was the one suing the federal government to get the get them to declassify their records. Wow! So I'm hanging out with the, talking to the, the, the pinnacle. These You're hanging the out with the pinnacle. Yeah, the guys at the tip top. That's yeah. who. That's yeah. who happened to be sitting down ne- across from me. Yeah. And then and then we just start bullshitting. And then the, because I had a little nugget to share about the, what I had seen at the JV conference. They're like, oh, okay, I guess you're okay. So they invite me up to their room to go drink whiskey. Wow. And I hang out with these guys for four hours. Amazing. I show them my podcast trailer. They uh, they invite me to do a project with them. I'm now writing a book with James D. Eugenio. <laughs> my king, I'm so proud of you. You're the fucking man. We're, awesome. we're writing a book together. That's amazing. <laughs> that is crazy. That is crazy. I'm telling you people, all you got to do is see the crazy shit and then show up where you see the crazy shit happening. And go. It's going to happen. You it, did it. it. I've done it so many times. You did that with, oh my God, everybody. You did it with TMZ and everybody. I did, Kanye is I your... met so many, but before that, so like, yeah, but before that, so many other dumb things happened. Like, I met Nicki Minaj the same way, Drake the same way, tons of producers the same way. Um, what was your, I, think you, I think you told me about Drake. I think you remember that. Yeah, it's just, just, I mean, just these one off interactions yeah. that are like, I was hungry. It wasn't like, 
hey, let's hang out. And she was like, bitch, I'm trying to rap. Like, <laughs> like, yeah. I'm like, I'm trying to rap for you right now. Like, are you trying to hear it right now? Was really my my only like question. Like, are you trying to hear a rap right now? And like, how long do I have? Like, yo, can I get your attention for a period of time where I feel like I could start rapping? Like, that was really my only energy. And like, uh, when I showed up to Cali, you know, once Jamie got his job with Joe, that became, we saw the blueprint work. So then it became like, how do we do this again? How do we recreate it? And then we just kept recreating it over and over and over and over and over. And it, and what we found is like all the, it doesn't, you don't catch the huge fish all the time, but you're fishing. Uh -huh. And like, you know that the fish is in here. Uh -huh. You know, it's, if you're showing up to the right pond and yeah. you know the fish is here, yes. then like, what do you... The only two options are keep fishing or quit fishing. Amen. Like, that's it. So, like, we just keep fishing, and it just kept happening, kept happening. And now it's got to the point where these manifestations, if you will, are, you know, multi-billionaires that we're aligned with or hanging out with. And it's, I feel, it's it's got laughable. I mean, it's literally got to the point to where, like, when you tell me this story of, like, I'm writing a book, I'm like, I'm not surprised. This is, I'm, not, I'm the Nate Diaz grabbing the mic from Joe. I'm not, I'm not surprised that he's writing a book. It's not going to be long before you got a movie. And, like, I was just telling Eric. I have a movie coming out in November. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you really? Yeah, what, do. Are, what are oh, you I didn't doing? tell you. No. It's a major. Uh, uh, <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I, I'm sorry. I thought I told. Um, I, it's uh, I got hit up from the podcast. This lady who's a producer. She she. Long story That's short, incredible. Um, a major <laughs> network. It's got three letters in it. Okay, uh -huh. it's one of the big one networks. Of the big boys. Yeah, uh, has exclusive footage of the Parkland doctors. And uh, they had a reunion in 1992 or 93, like right after the movie JFK movie came out. Uh -huh. And most of them were still alive. And they basically just, there's, it's just them on tape talking about their recollections of all, what they all saw. And so they had this exclusive footage and they approached this it's woman. It's not out anywhere? It's not out yet. Wow. It, comes out, it comes out in November. No, this is footage though. This footage is Correct. off the Correct. market. Okay, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so they approached this woman about uh, who's done other documentaries. Um, I think I, I don't know if I can say her. She she did the Ghislaine Maxwell documentary sure. that's on uh, Peacock right now. I haven't watched it. Um, I haven't either. But uh, she has good opinions about the world. I will say, it's shocking to me that mm -hmm. she's allowed to exist in that environment. But but uh, but anyway, um, so her job was to put together a documentary around that footage. So this is crazy. They she has she has three talking heads in in the documentary that exist basically to frame that footage and kind of talk about what happened overall, mm -hmm. yada yada yada. She's got the conspiracy guy who is uh the guy who's the chief medical researcher for um the As assassination records review board. <laughs> so He's the conspiracy guy? Yeah, he's the conspiracy guy. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> All right. And then they have the the <laughs> Warren Report defender guy who is this world renowned forensic pathologist who was the head of the medical board for the House Select Committee on Assassinations wow. in 1978. Wow. And How old is he? He's late. He's older. I mean, he's, I think, I, 70s? Yeah, that Dr. Michael. Yeah, I can't, I shouldn't say his name, but he's, he's older. That's okay. Dr. Michael Bodden's his name. I don't know if, how much I'm supposed to say about this. I, I won't say the name of it or the network that's, that's coming out. But, um, but anyway, uh, and then there's me. I'm the third talking. Hey, man, baby, yes. That's what I'm talking about, <laughs> King Crump. So yeah, I went to Cleveland and did this thing and filmed for like five hours with them. And uh, there was like seven people in there. There was one, uh, this one woman's job was to tell me when my shirt was coming untucked and when I was tapping my leg too much. Yeah, sure. That's how much attention was being paid to yeah, me. Yeah, so good. It was very exciting. That's awesome to hear. So yeah, it comes out in November and it's on a, one of the major streaming platforms. I was just telling Eric, uh, we had a call, a uh, good friend, Eric Genius, Crypto Genius. Follow him on Twitter, uh, NFA.crypto, spelled out. Mm -hmm. um, he's brilliant. We were talking just the other day, and he was asking me, you know, he's like, what's, he's thinking, like, what's next? You know, I'm uh, talking about monetization and, like, what his content's going to look like moving forward, his ideas that he has right now. And I just, I was like, you know, he's asked me the same question about the podcast. Like, why are you doing the podcast? Like, what's, and I was telling him he should come talk and we should kick it. And I was like, you know, I, I just feel like we ne I need to record these men that I know yeah. 
our spe- like I've known that you were going to crush it with the JFK. But as soon as you first started telling me, I was like, oh, it's going to fucking murder. I know <laughs> it. Like, it's just, you're not the guy to like show up and put out shit. Like you're the guy to show up and put out something dope. And there's, regardless of what anybody says, there's not that much dope stuff out here. It's very different. Like, I don't know if, if you're, if you're listening to this and feel like the world is flooded with great content, but you're wrong. <laughs> like, like, I mean, I mean, we've never had so much stuff. And I mean, how, how many times do you sit around and go, well, there's nothing to watch. Like you, you find something yeah. you love and then you, and then you watch all of those and you binge on it. Mm-hmm. And then you're just like, ah, there's nothing out. Yeah, man. What else was I going to say? Dude, I was listening to your, uh, one of your new songs on the way over here. Got, Thanks. Got, got it. it. Mm-hmm. Got it. I mm-hmm. like that song. I listen Thanks. to Quench too. Quench okay. is all right. I think I need to remix it. Yeah. Did you have a high? Did you did the highs bother you? No, no, it didn't bother. It's just a lot of just like instruments, like an instrumental yeah, like it's experimentation it's really, type. Yes. Uh, I, um, there's some cool shit going going on though. Thanks. I got um I got like 20 songs ready to go, and like this is I'm I'm trying to get 50 songs before Kane gets here. Uh-huh. My ba- my baby, our baby is on the way. What, uh, what's his name? His name's Kane Grayson. Kane. Okay, nice. Yeah, K was gonna do. K picked it. I didn't. I didn't have anything to do with the name. I didn't even like pick from a list or nothing. Kendra was like, his name is Kane, and his middle name is Gray. And I was like, are we sure we're gonna go Kane Gray? And she was like, no, but I'm working on it. And then a couple of days later, she came back. She's like, I'm, we're gonna go Kane Grayson because my middle name's okay. Gray. Yeah. So just go Gray Son, and yeah. we're in there. And I'm trying to get to a place. I mean, it's a very interesting. I love that you brought this up. I'm trying to get to a place right now where I'm not a slave to my creativity and my uh, th- my task list. Uh-huh. I I am uh, making pretty decent money in my life, and I'm I am also at a place of what I think is normal angst for uh, starting a family. Of like, okay, I gotta go. I gotta, I got a lot uh-huh. to do. I gotta make sure that like income's coming. I gotta make sure yeah. I have plenty of money around. You know, whatever. All the thoughts, preparation, get my ducks in a row, whatever uh-huh. you call it. But I'm also at this place where I've done that for years. I've there's no I'm I've ne- I don't take days off. There's no vacation. Uh-huh. I don't know how, like. I don't know how to vacation. I love my life so much. I don't like vacation. I don't want to vacation. Is work. Uh-huh. Life is fire, especially when you get back and you have all the emails. It, it's a lot, <laughs> vacation is actual work because I have to stop myself from being creative. I have to stop myself from being like, "Oh, wait a minute, I have to write this down. I have to do this thing right now." That's what I do in my regular life. And when a moment of creativity strikes, I have to act now. I'm acting in the moment, or I can bottle it by writing things down that I know that I need, and I'll respark that energy at uh-huh. nine p.m. Whatever, right, right. whenever I get to it. Um, not whenever I get to it, you know, soon, like six, you know, six, eight hours away from the the uh-huh. spark till activity. I'm trying to get to a place to where I have a long enough um, pipeline of work that my creativity can be in action, but I'm not a slave to that list of like, I have so much stuff to do and where it's like uh-huh. a drain of like right. uh, just a never ending. I have so much, I have so much because I see other people in the world, especially people with kids that seem to always be running late. They're always in like this angst energy of like next thing, next yeah. thing. Cause they're on a schedule and they know like whatever it's like bath t- dinner times at six or bath times at you know seven yeah. or eight bed times at this time. And they're always next thing, next thing. It's like their life is so scheduled. Bam, 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 all the way through. And I'm trying to get to a better place to where I know I have a huge bag of work to pull from and I can pull from things that are like, oh, this will only take me two hours. Yeah. This, I have a day, so I'll pull this one today because I have 12 hours, whatever. Yeah. And it's tough. I'm just trying to balance it and I've got a lot going. So, like, thank you for listening. I really appreciate that you're checking out my new tunes. My yeah, kid. dude. No, I'm not course, promoting man. much anywhere. I just a tweet here and there. And it feels really good to just be able to put out music. And not think about it too much and get some decent feedback. Yeah, I like. I, no, I, I really like that one. I'll, Thanks. I'll, I, uh, Thanks. I mean, "Colder in the Garden" was too. Was cool. "Colder Col- in the Garden" is my my third biggest song right now. "Colder in the Garden" is the great. is the song that I think most closely represents you as a person. I agree. Um, I'm getting to a place. Out. Thank you. I agree. I'm getting to that and "Forever and Now." Uh, "Forever and Now" is a troubled time for me though, so I don't resonate with that song as totally today as I do with "Colder, Colder in the Garden." Is who I am today. "Colder in the Garden" yeah. is. Cam. I was like, well, that's my friend Cam. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes I'm like, oh, this is this rapper. Yeah. I hear the rapper, and I'm like, oh, this fucking rapper. 
Bro, thank you for saying. Ass. Thank but you for saying it that can. way. I appreciate that. <laughs> I do. I feel the same way. I, I'm at. I'm at a place where I am. Um, I'm comfortable being totally transparent and like so much so that like I'm playing with ideas. Like a couple of years ago, I had the idea of like being a politician. That like, what if I just opened up my life of like I literally am for the people, and I'm not even gonna fucking eat if y'all don't feed me. And like I had this serious <laughs> talk with Kendra. And Kay was like, they'd probably just let you die for the content. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, you're such a bad bitch. I love you so much. <laughs> and I'm like, I was like, just imagining, I like picturing myself like sitting in the street with a live stream of like, if you guys don't send $7, I can't get Burger King or whatever it is. Like I need to that's eat. Funny. But like, I feel like that's the only way to really be of service is to like chain yourself to the people in such a way that I will literally starve. Like literally just be like, I don't have a bank account. You gonna count my houses? <laughs> I don't have a bank account. Like I need this Venmo to come through to eat tonight or to get to wherever I'm going. I represent you all so hard. Isn't and, it funny that it's the opposite? It's like whenever you, you go in, if you don't have money, you have a lot coming out. Sure. That's I'm, weird. It is weird. How does that happen? It is so weird. How does, how does Nancy <laughs> Pelosi have so much money? She's not the only one. There's a shit. There's a whole list of whole, the, uh, all the usual list. whales. It's, all the, it's, it's so weird to me that we're in this predicament with so much information we have like such clarity and transparency on information and to the tribal filters plus overall not even that it's it's that but it's also like there's so much information how much of today's history will be remembered accurately in a, in 200 years like i don't know if any none because uh, history is already not remembered it's, that's, al it's that's already what I mean. recent history has been totally rewritten or in some cases hidden from people mm -hmm. and uh you know there are major things that we we still don't fully understand, which I may do podcast on in the future. We'll see. I, we need to do this again. Let's <laughs> let's wrap this one up today. Yeah, um, I really appreciate your time, Matt. You're a fucking incredible person. Cheers, You're so prolific. I'm I'm grateful to call you friend. Not not for all the things you do, uh, those added, but for the man you are. You're a fucking awesome man, and I'm very grateful to have a king like you. Cheers, in my man. Life. I feel the same way. Thanks, Cam. Appreciate yeah. you, man. I love you, brother. Love you too. Um, tell the people where they can check out JFK. Tell uh, where your next show is. Yeah, yeah. And um, where they can book uh, their next <laughs> camp, a lot of campsite. <laughs> SolvingJFKPodcast.com uh, is where you can find all the information, get all the transcripts and citations from the podcast. TikTok um, account. Yes, yeah, I'm, I'm on TikTok, Solving JFK. Um, and then I'm at on Matt, Twitter too. at Matt Crumpton on Twitter and, and, and solving JFK. But if you want to get the personal shit, and then uh, what else? The Winnie Cooper Project. You know, we're playing. Uh, we're headlining the Food Truck Fest in Columbus uh, at the Hilliard Fairgrounds in oh, August. Nice. Uh, Sunday we're closing it out, and uh, we're playing just a bunch of weddings and stuff. Otherwise, and let's see. That's it. Music Loves Ohio, uh, Riverbend Family Campground. What's Music Loves Ohio? Where's the Music Loves Ohio website? Dot com. Music Loves Music Ohio. Loves Ohio dot org. Dot org. Okay. Yes. There you go. There's all the things, man. Thanks for having me on. My king. Thanks for coming. Love Cheers. you very much. See you Cheers. soon. All right, dude. Thanks.